Vogel Eye Almost Live Zoom. Your Eyes, My Vision. Hosted by Amy Amanti. With special guests, Linda Bartram, Laurel Dundee, Louise Johnson, Nancy Gill, Christy Cassie, Josie Horsman, and Ruth Beaver. Welcome to this Vocal Eye Almost Live event. My name is Amy Amanti. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Associate Director for Vocal Eye. I'm your host for these Almost Live events, and I'm a member of the blind community. And I just, as I do every week, want to send a big thank you to all of you who have donated and sent us support letters and testimonials and contributed all your thoughts and love and and your your hard-earned dollars it really really means a lot to us um, as you all know we offer this programming week after week um, we think it's high quality we get lots of feedback from you all that it's high quality so uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for all of those uh, testimonials and donations uh, there's always a link that's posted in the chat if you want to access that um, and in our follow-up newsletters uh, if you happen to be watching this on our YouTube channel, absolutely, we hope that you hover over and we click on like and subscribe. That would really help us out. I want to acknowledge that Vocalize is broadcasting to you all from the unceded territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil First Peoples. As I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you, considering that we have a bunch of artists in our space tonight, I wanted to do a little bit of work and a little bit of research on Indigenous arts and artists. And so here's some things that I learned that I thought I might share with you tonight. That art made by Indigenous artists is embodied and expressed by living people who carry the knowledge of their ancestors and they share it with us. In modern days, we see everything from high fashion to gifts to intricate carvings to even smartphone cases. Um, the Indigenous artists and craftspeople in Canada weave cultural traditions and modernity to create high quality, striking goods. Indigenous merchandise sometimes integrates traditional craftsmanship, craft, craftsmanship that's been passed down through oral traditions, which I think is so beautiful. Um, but they also may infuse themselves with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous techniques, which is also really interesting as um, Indigenous folks are exploring some of uh, the modern techniques of art making and including them in their work. Um, when, what I also learned is that when we're looking to purchase Indigenous art, there's a couple of things that Indigenous peoples are asking us to consider when we make those purchases. So those things are making sure that you always buy ethically and authentically. And this is not just about protecting the buyer's investment, but it's about respecting the world's oldest living cultural um, tradition of art making, ensuring that the artists and those around them are paid fairly and, um, and can secure a sustainable future. For example, many Indigenous artists from around the world are making their livings off of the art that they sell. So, of course, when people are um, misrepresenting their work as Indigenous um, or selling fakes, uh, that impacts people who are making a living and who are wanting to share their work. So um, the literature I found also says never, never be afraid to ask questions who the artist is, where the artist is from, how the artist is being paid, especially when you're buying something from a gallery or a store. If you're with an, uh, an Indigenous artist in person, ask them about, you know, whether or not the piece has some sentimental meaning in terms of their process making, because oftentimes pieces very much have a story to tell. I also just want to acknowledge that February is Black History Month, and um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about Omari Newton, who's a local playwright here in Vancouver. Some of you uh, in this space heard the audio play Redbone Coonhound, and then some of our local community members went and saw Redbone Coonhound when it was mounted on stage. And, um, and I wanted to just give you an update because uh, Omari Newton is uh, identifies as a black playwright. Um, he's a friend of Vocali, uh, came out and said hello to the to the community when he did Redbone Coonhound. And um, and what's lovely is, is that Redbone Coonhound has been picked up by other theaters across Canada. So this show with its um, interesting, educational, exciting content, um, really speaking to um, really speaking to people on a, on a very interesting level about racism and interracial relationships uh, is going to be on stages in places like Toronto and, and perhaps Montreal. And so that's really exciting news for Omari and for Amy Lee Lavoie, his wife, and uh, and for Redbone Coonhound. So I just want to extend our greatest uh, six wishes of success from Vocali to, uh, to our Redbone Coonhound family. So there you are, friends. 
All right. Um, well, I think it's time to get on with tonight's programming. So another official welcome to you all. It's Wednesday, February the 1st, 2023. And tonight we're proud to offer you our almost live event number 108, Your Eyes, My Vision. Really excited about this. This feels like a full circle moment. So uh, before we go any further, I want to bring in Linda Bartram and Laurel Dundee into the space because we're gonna do a little bit of a chit chat about your eyes, my vision. So I see we got Linda. So Linda, let's let's go ahead and start with you. So will you give us a little bit of a, a reminder of what this project is, how it, how it came to be? Because I know that you're intimately involved with it. <laughs> yes, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, your eyes, my vision. Um, has been made possible by a grant from the Disability Alliance British Columbia and we received the grant a year ago and just about a year ago in March last year I came on and promoted this project and put the the message out uh, and the invitation out to participants in Vocali Almost Live if they would like to participate as a blind artist in this project. And what we did was we paired up blind artists who wished, who had a vision of something that they wished to create. Um, we, we call it visual art with quotation marks around that, obviously, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for, for various reasons. Um, but we weren't, we weren't looking at uh, performing arts. We were looking at, you know, uh, visual arts or anything that falls in that genre. And we paired these folks who applied for the project with a uh, facilitator. So this was a sighted individual. Um, all of them, I believe, are artists. They may not have had a lot of experience in the area that they were assisting with, but they uh, came along with their eyes to assist us create our vision. And uh, the project gave everybody uh, a budget of up to $500 to buy supplies and, and anything that they needed to make it happen. And we also paid our facilitators 500, up to $500 to assist. So here we are one year later, and we had uh, 16 applicants came into the project at the beginning. One unfortunately had to pull out. So we have, have 15. Okay, of perfect. Of so which it's oh, now muted. I'm I'm hearing somebody talking yeah. in my ear. <laughs> That's okay. We'll we'll, we'll get uh, our vocal eye folks to just mute them. Okay, thank Go you. Ahead, um, yeah. So um, uh, about nine of nine or ten of the artists are are virtually finished, and there's a few that a couple that are still just doing up the finishing touches on their on their uh, art pieces. And um, we hope everybody will get a chance to finish eventually. Um, we're extending the program for a couple of months so that we can see everybody through to conclusion of their art project. Um, officially, it finished, I guess, today. Um, and, um, but we're carrying on with this live, this uh, virtual art show tonight. And then we have a live art show in Victoria on the 11th of February. Um, which we weren't anticipating in the beginning, but we think we can do it now. <laughs> and, um, and we also are going to hopefully set up a network of anybody who participated in the project and anybody else who'd like to join us. And that can be both facilitators and, and artists, blind artists, uh, so that we can stay in touch and hopefully keep connected so that we can carry on doing projects in the future with, with, you know, with one another's help. So that's the project in a nutshell. And I was fortunate to be able to actually participate as an artist as well. So that was kind of a, a bonus for me. You've got your, your fingers in all the pies. That's my, my, I, my, I, my well, metaphor. That, that's me. Yeah. Grant <laughs> I don't writer, have fingers. <laughs> board member, yeah, artist, yeah. <laughs> administrator. Um, and we, we were really fortunate to, to be able to find Laurel Dundee, who's on the call tonight as well and we brought her in as the project coordinator so she did a lot of the behind the scenes legwork connecting people finding the facilitators and uh, helping people with you know uh, finding programs um, finding classes mm -hmm. yeah so Super um, helpful. yeah very yeah, I'd, helpful. Love to, I'd love to hear from Laurel about her experience can we ask Laurel about that yeah 
what do you say laurel because there's a lot of administration but there's also a lot of like pairing and making sure that matches are successful and so what was your experience like yeah you know, pretend been... that your boss isn't in the space listening to you <laughs> I write it all in our report, so I know what she's going to say. Um, yeah, no, it's it's been great. I think I've been describing this job for the last year as like the best job I've ever had. Um, oh. Like getting paid to give people money to create art has been so rewarding. I mean, even though I haven't been able to really help out do the art myself, um, like watching all of the art come in the last few months has just been great. I think every time I get an email with an art piece, I... I like go and show my roommate and like my friends and my family like look look at what they made like this is so cool um so it's been it's been really really rewarding um as an artist myself i really think that like everyone has like a creative vision within them um and like there's all kinds of ways of expressing that and i think anyone can like no matter like who you are or what your background is everyone has like a, a story within them that um it's really great to to give people the opportunity to like get it out there and, and to be able to see it and feel it and talk about it. It's just really been great. Well, I, I know that that this isn't necessarily part of the project, but you said you're an artist yourself. So would you mind, since we're all artists in the space tonight, yeah. <laughs> maybe telling us a little bit about the kind of art that you do? Yeah, um, I do a lot of digital illustration, which is sadly not super accessible. Um, I think this project, doing this project has made me think like, how can I make this more accessible to other people? Like I, I need to write all text um, so that people can like be able to mm -hmm. um, perceive it in some way. But yeah, I do a lot of digital illustration, um, a lot of fantasy illustration, um, a lot of like, creature designs and like magical views of the woods. I'm very inspired by uh, the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Vancouver and walking through the woods a lot as a kid really stuck with me and continues to inspire me to this day. Mm, I love that. Um, and you also wrote the image descriptions for the pieces tonight. So what was that like for you? Because um, is this something that you've done a lot of or not a lot of? I'm, I'm sensing not because you were just talking about the fact that you're thinking about how you can make your digital stuff more accessible. Well, you already know a little bit about um, image descriptions. Yeah, um, I've done it a little bit before. Um, I put on another show last year um, for the um, Victoria Disability Resource Center. Um, and I wrote a lot of the alt text for that. Um, but what I found with this is truly like there's so many little details. I think a lot that I take for granted, like being able to see something and like really like know like I do need to describe every facet of this, um, which really makes me like appreciate pieces a lot more because um, I really have to think about all of the details and all of the work that went into it and describe like every every corner and, and every element. I'm really excited to um, explore these pieces in the space with our friends. Is there any last thoughts from either one of you before we start to introduce our artists in the space? I've got lots to say, but I'm going to say it in my little <laughs> piece. <laughs> well, you're, I mean, you're, you're with us through the whole event. Well, so exactly. Um, so Linda and I are going to take the sort of the interview lead on this. Uh, so that's great. All right, Laurel. So we'll we'll sort of um, we'll uh, not say goodbye to you, but you can relax. You don't have to be on camera anymore. But we'll hear your voice popping in when we do the uh, image descriptions. So you'll always be in the wings. And Linda, you and I are going to welcome in our first guest in a moment. Um, but I want to just so Louise, you're standing by. Louise is standing by, and uh, uh, you can turn your camera on, and we'll bring you into the space. Um, so Linda, just before we get started, um, have you got any well wishes for our artist friends tonight? Any piece I know it's a, I know it's a bit nerve wracking <laughs> to come and speak, and some of us have not ever exhibited before, mm -hmm. so this is a first time for a lot of us. Um, we're all feeling the same, so we're we're amongst friends and uh, just relax and and speak from your heart. Wonderful. So we've got Louise Johnson joining us in the space. Welcome, Louise. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're going to we're going to bring up your image in a second, but I just wanted to ask you if there's any way in which you wanted to introduce the image before we hear the image description. No, you want us just to bring it up and we'll, we'll yeah, start there? yeah, let's do okay. that. Let's do that. So we'll have Rick bring up the image. Uh, this one's entitled Princess Kiara. And Laurel, uh, now that the image is up, Laurel's going to read the image description for us. So go ahead, Laurel. 
All right. Um, so it's a small one and a foot half tall clay sculpture of her black guide dog, Kiara, sitting down with her tail curled around to the right. She has a brown and white dog harness made of clay on, and she has a real collar with three name tags made of clay that read Princess Kiara, Half a Dog, and Squirrely Girl, which have been engraved into the clay. She also has a real leash, which can be attached to the collar. The clay of the dog has been textured to mimic the texture of her fur. And what's the color of the dog? It's black. Oh <laughs> See yeah. all these details and I forget. All the details. Perhaps yeah. the most important thing. <laughs> That's, That's why I'm here to help guide you all. Wonderful. All right. So we'll take the image down and we'll talk to Louise about this. So Louise, um, it might seem obvious to some folks, but who is Princess Kiara? <laughs> Princess Kiara is my guide dog. Um, Kiara is her official name and because I couldn't say her name right off the bat, I called her princess. Mm -hmm. And as I learned to say her name, Kiara, um, she was considered my princess. So when making this piece, I mean, because I remember when when Linda came into the space, Linda, you might remember this too, and you shared with us this project that you're going to, really exciting project, and Louise was like, mm, I don't know, I'm not really an artist, I don't know if I can. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Louise, what was it that, that, you, that made you decide, I'm going to go for this project and figure out what, you know, what I can make? Well, when I first thought about it, I thought, I remember being in clay or pottery in, in high school and making, putting my hands in the clay and being creative with it. I thought, well, can I make a creative image of my guide dog? And that was what came to my mind, but I did not know if I could do it. I didn't know how I could do it. And it took days for me to accept that that was what was going to happen. And as, as each part of it went along, each the day I got accepted on her ninth birthday, actually got the email saying I was accepted to the project. I sat there and cried. I actually Aww. cried. And actually, Amy and I had only been speaking about the project only 15 minutes before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it was like, then exactly. my vision came more over the next months, came more even true. And well, I started thinking, what could I do with the project? So why do you why was it important to you then because so you've got this sculpture made out of clay right um and it's it's a foot and a half tall so it's it's i don't know i don't know how big kiara is but it's almost life size kiara is 20 mm, 21 and a half inches tall she is an average 52 pounds of a guide dog she's a, a cute little black lab um She's now got gray in the front of her, which we tried to get a little bit, if you can see the, if people who can see, can see a little bit of coloring in her, underneath her chin, on her chin, we tried to get a little bit of gray into the, in the coloring of it. Yeah. Um, I wanted an image of how she was and who she was through her career. Right. And so I tried to create in my mind all the special moments. And when I started working with my first visit with my, um, um, helper who, who is actually here tonight, Tegan. Um, I had different things and we sat and tried to figure out which way we could put it into my vision into making, to make it into something that would create and have an image. And this is sitting in front of my prior fireplace now on a guide dog towel that has paws ah. on it. Ah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. She's got her own little resting place. <laughs> How is, um, how is Princess Kiara reacting to the statue of Princess Kiara? Is she noticing it at all? She, she doesn't notice it, but I, I have a funny one to share. So my son Dylan was here a few weeks after he came home one night and he was leaving the, from the house here. Instead of going and saying goodbye to Kiara, he went over to the statue <laughs> and says goodbye and pets it like, goodbye Kiara. And it was like, <laughs> and Kiara's looking at him and well, and I'm going to get any attention. And he turned to her and says, well, when you're not here, I have something to remember you by. Oh, that's sweet. Louise, can we talk a little bit about your process as the artist? What was that like for you? Had you ever done anything with clay before? Yes, I had back in high school. I did a semester and where I did like just, 
like a pencil holder, an ashtray, those kind of projects. So something small, there were small little, you know, things I made back and painted that then. So yeah. when I went in to start this, I remember um, Tegan handing me my first strip and showing me, remember, and as soon as I started, things came back to my memory. And it was like, it was just natural to put my hands into that clay and to work with it, roll it, to stack it on, you know, to glue, you know, put the moisture in between, like the cuttings into it and then put the moisture on it to put it all together layer by layer. So it's done by layer by layer up um, and in areas. And it was like, just getting a hand in there and just doing it and quitting my heart. Putting every piece I put together, it was like, it was putting a part of my dog in my heart forever. Oh, Louise, that's so sweet. When you, um, when you were in the, um, the studio working with the clay, how long did that take? We did it in two sessions. And the okay. first one was about two and a half, three, no, three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And the second one, we were there to do the clay part, ooh, four and a half hours. So it took us a good, you know, I, I, I'm thinking approximate, you know, that's not including the painting later. Right. After it had been kilned and everything. So there was three sessions. The second session was when, when, it, when it was finished and it was all put together. I'm looking at it and going, do I really think this has got the image of what I want? And when it came back and I felt the, the way we, so I'll explain a little piece on the back of the harness, on the back, up at the top of the harness, there's like, if you, I don't think oh, if you can see it in the paint, in the picture at all, but there's like little piece, it's got like markings in it. It's like, we put the fur over the um, harness piece. And that is what she does when she walks. It, her hair comes over that. Yeah. So I wanted that image and feeling in it. And, and those are kind of those things. And there was the fat, it turned gray, or I could feel her. There was certain spots I wanted to feel her fur in certain ways. And I got that feeling. Well, and, I mean, that's the next question I had for you is like, what does it feel like to touch this, this piece that you made? Like it feels, it, it feels weird in a sense, because it's like, because I still have her here. She's still working. Yeah. But when I touch it and I put my hand on it and I feel the different things, I think of the, I think of how I took the clay and moved it, some of the, the clay into certain things. Now, yes, Tegan did a help with certain areas, but what I'm saying is areas I could put my hand and make it work or like this, the little squirrel, the little bone and the little heart. I sat and I, I took those in my hand and sculpted them to the perfect shape of what I wanted and I had to downsize them once <laughs> each of them <laughs> or they would have been too big yeah because they're just but, attached to the collar right they're the tags on the collar they're actually attached to the leash they're the not leash. on the uh, it's, they're not on the the leash it's, it's separate with the three tags we got a piece of wire connecting them to the to the, the loop that like the but where you would put a leash to like the collar to so well, not the collar the um there's a ring on there that you would, you know, sort of, you would, we got the wire through that and it's coming out to each of the separate ones. They have a little hole in them to connect the, um, the each, like the bone or the heart or the squirrel. Wonderful. Linda, have you got anything you want to ask Louise? No, I think you've covered most of it. I'm really looking forward to you coming over to, to Victoria though, to present it in, to showcase it at our, um, live art show because we'll at, we will be able to experience you know what you're talking about now and oh, uh Louise, that's give awesome her, give her a, we'll give her a little pet for everybody else <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome I remember last last weekend during our social you were talking about the live art showing so you're going yes I am I it happened on Sunday thanks to my son and his and his wife wonderful that's really exciting I'm so excited for you congratulations Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So you're going to stick around and you're going to yes. join us for the Q&A at the end. And I know Tegan's here and we'll have a little chat with Tegan as well. So thank you, Louise, for sharing your art with us. It's uh, lovely. And, and thanks to Princess Kiara for being your model. Well, 
<laughs> I can't wait to show it off. Awesome. All right, friends, that was Louise Johnson and her piece, The Princess Kiara. Um, next, we're going to welcome in Nancy into the space. So Nancy Gill is joining us. <clears throat> so we'll give Nancy a moment to pop in. I see Nancy. Um, so Nancy, I, I gave Louise an opportunity to introduce the piece before we show the picture and describe it. Is there anything you would like to say about your piece of work to introduce it? I think Nancy's still on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now, my friend. Oh, great. Thank you. Now, my video? Yep, we, we can see you. We can hear you. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So is there anything you'd like to say to introduce the work? Um, I would like to say thank you to Linda and Laura Dundee and Amy, uh, Annie. I didn't, I didn't do anything. <laughs> and Andy. Well, we got me to come on Vocal Eye and Gary from Mexico for helping me make this happen. And I'm here today to show off my what I made. Awesome. All right, then. Well, what we'll do is we'll bring up the, the photo of the item. This item is called the Eagle. Okay. And Rick's going to bring it up. And then once it's up, Laurel is going to do the description. All right, my friend Laurel, you're up. All right. Um, so it's a shallow rectangular catch all dish made of clay. On the dish is painted the head of an eagle in an indigenous style using strong black lines with white, yellow, and red paint inside the lines. The eagle faces to the right. The eye of the eagle has a white outer circle, a yellow middle circle, and a red pupil in the middle. The beak of the eagle is open to reveal a red tongue. The rest of the eagle is painted in white, except for one triangular section of the beak, which is red. Mm, thank you, Laurel. Do we have an idea of the, because it's a catch-all dish. So can you maybe just describe what a catch-all dish to us is? So if we're not sure what yeah. that means? Yeah, so it's it's just like a, a little rectangular plate, um, very shallow. You might put like your keys in there, some rings, um, you know, it's a catch catch all, just like little odds odds and ends. So it doesn't have like high edges like a bowl would. So it's more no, a, no, a little it's bit of shallow. An yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, this is a, a lovely photo, and so I want to talk with Nancy through some of the process. So thank you, Rick, for displaying the eagle for us. Um, Nancy, so I'm going to ask you some of the same questions that I asked Louise was why the eagle, why this dish, what, what was the, um, the idea around that being the, the project? Well, my, um, I've always had, my son is native and I'm Indo-Canadian he's half native, half East Indian, and I have nothing in my house native. And I thought, you know what, I want to find out where he's from Lillooet. And he's um, his family's from Lillooet, and their their fountain. So I thought, well, why don't I do something that I really like? And then, like I, I asked questions, what you know, I can do. I wanted to do a whale, but I decided to do an eagle because it. I've always liked eagles, and you know, it just made me feel something special that I can give this to my son because this, you know, records represents his culture, right? And I thought this was the best thing for me to do, and I just. I did. I, I thought I was gonna make a big leap, but it would end up being a, a the face because it he's younger and it's great to have something of an eagle face, and that's what I did. And it and it, it's a it's a dish, so it's something that he can either hang or he, he can actually put something on it. It's half the size of a um, I'm gonna say a muff, not a, a loaf pan, but it's 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 nice because when oh, yeah, I travel okay. around the world, you see a dish, and that dish you see pictures on it, and I thought you know why can't I do something like that? And that's what I did. I wanted something special for my son. So that's, I gave him on his birthday. Oh, that's a lovely sentiment, Nancy. Um, so talk to me about, cause it's in the description, we learn it's made out of clay. So did you go and shape this out of clay? How was that process? Well, I'm going to explain to I, I really, I'm going to, I'm going to have, I, I like to bake. I like, she asked me if I like doing things. I said, yeah, I like to use my hand. So she, she came over to my house and it was a, it's an eight hour project. She came to my house and she took all this stuff out. 
Angie, and um, I had Jerry take pictures, but it reminds me, I was, it was a clay, actually, I had to form, it's like cheese, a brick of cheese that I had to form it and squeeze and soften it to make it where I wanted to get to. And then I got to use a rolling pin and flatten it. And then we got to, I got to cut it, like use it, you know, with a knife and everything else to cut the edges out because she made a cardboard to shape the, the, the what I was going to do and then she what she did is um we were uh, with the leftover I had to make a, a snake so I could make a stand for it for underneath and then we curl the edges up so we can hold the plate up just like a little tilt to it and then we baked it we baked it for 15 minutes and then wow. at the same time I had leftover so I decided to make something for my granddaughter so I made her a dish her first baby dish so I can put her symbol in it. So then I decided, then she made me get the color red, white, and black attract me because I seen, because when I was younger, I get to see all these native colors and I like that color. And then I got, because I'm East Indian, I wanted to get gold in the eyes because that recommends me, right? Gold, because we like gold. And so then we started painting and I was nervous. I was really nervous. I started crying because I can't believe I'm doing this because, you know, it's like, oh my God, this is actually happening because, you know, I don't, I can't, I can't use, she keeps moving my hand because I was going offline, but at least I was just scared that I was going to, it's not going to work out, but it ended up being beautiful. And I thought, wow, so I can't believe I did I, I'm this. curious because it's, it, the eagle takes up the entire, uh, the entire dish. Yeah, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty intricate in in like I would for me if I was painting I would be worried about like painting outside the lines you know messing up the lines. <laughs> so how how did you how, what was the how was it like to paint it, Nancy? How were, were you nervous? Were you how did you I do that? I was too nervous. I was I, you know I, I was crying at the same time doing it because I can't believe I was doing this. And every time I tried to do something, I was like I'm shaking and shaking. I felt like. I know when you make something on a cupcake, you just eat, you're, no one's going to see it, you just eat it, right? right. So for me, yeah. to, for me to go, go slivers, slivers, but it was like the way she had, um, she put it on a, um, I guess she had a, a something like a sketch or something, and I had to go over, over like on top of it. But if it, oh, like a me, stencil. Yeah, like, and, but like I've never done that before. And I go, but then I thank God I had plastic on the table, but I was going all over the place anyway. She goes, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I was nervous because I go, well, you know, because like, you know, what if I make a mess? Oh, no, no, no. And I, like, and I, it's okay. It's okay. She kept calming me down, but she was, you know, and then they were taking video tape. Jerry was taking pictures of me and I go, oh, no, it's going to look awful. And then, oh, my God. And it dropped, we waited till the white one. Then you know, we did the red. Then we did the white. And then the black. The black was hard it's because it was really, you know, you, you had to make it perfect. Because those are the, the, the side what your eyes are from the eagle. The, right. the whole thing but it was it was scary I was like I said I was nervous like I was I thought oh no I only have one chance you know you know she's like like this is it this is my project <laughs> I well I suppose I'm, I'm just being the devil's advocate here if you had messed up on the painting you could just paint it all white and start from scratch and then paint on top of the white again so maybe maybe but it sounds like you didn't mess it up because it looks pretty perfect it sounds pretty perfect well, I hope how, it is. <laughs> how, how, what did your son say when? Well, you know, it was, it was his birthday. And I said, Nathan, we're going to go out for dinner. And I, I got something special for you. And then I showed him and he goes, I said, Nathan, this is your present. He goes, who did this? I go, I did. He goes, you did? And I go, yes, Nathan, I can, you know, I, I, I can do something. And he was really shocked that I did it. Like, I go, it was amazing. Like, and I, but you can't take it home because I have to take it to Victoria. He goes, what? I go, yeah, wait till January. <laughs> till ah, February. <laughs> wonderful. So Linda, now we're going to, we've learned now that Nancy's also going to Victoria. Yes, Nancy's yeah. coming as well. So this is great. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I just can't believe that, you know, something that we can do. And this is, you know, it was so amazing that what we can do with our hands, even though we can't see. And, and I'm deaf and I was like, well, can I hear what she's saying? Or maybe I'm doing it wrong. It, it's just, it felt like, I felt like it was in my house. I didn't have to go anywhere. I was relaxed and we did it in eight hours. And, you know, it was unbelievable. And it, this is the best thing I've ever done. And it makes me feel that I can do something. I challenge myself to do something else next time. So, the next one, I would like to make an elephant to remember me or my mom. So, you know, ah, so, I'm, I'm, so you, 
Sorry, go ahead, Linda. No, I was just going to say, I'm curious, you used a, a material that doesn't have to be fired in a kiln. So it's something you can just put in the oven. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that's, it. that, yeah. So that's something that's a lot more accessible for us than, you know, if we don't have access to a kiln that, and, and I, I don't know if you remember the name of the, of the, um, what it was called. I'm sure that it's sure it's fairly common, but I just hadn't heard of that. Yeah, it just uh, something that she bought from Michael or someone. She's an artist or a, a native artist, and she she had everything in her bag, and it was unbelievable. We didn't have to go anywhere, uh, you know. It's like the paint, the, the all the stuff that she needed to bring down, and and it, you know, like I like I said, I like baking, I like cutting things, but I just didn't, you know. <laughs> that's way back then. Now, it's like when you lose your eyes, you're like, oh no, it's gonna look terrible. But it and did you did so you say the name of your of your facilitator? I didn't. Yes, her name is An Angie. 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 Yeah. Okay. Nancy, I, I think we probably gathered already the answer to this question, but what do you think is the value of having an artist work with you on something like this? Do you know what? It's amazing. I, I'm, I'm so glad I got it. It was the best match I ever had because, you know, it gives me an opportunity that, you know, she knew about the native art and she actually asked me what my son, where my son from. And, and I told her and, and she, she, she looked it up for me and, and what I had to do. And, and she asked a question that I told you, I, I'm, I like to, like I said, I like to bake and, and, you know, I like to use my hand, but, you know, I've never done things like painting, like I can't even paint a house and, you know, or even <laughs> try to paint, <laughs> but it made me feel that, you know, I'm so happy I had her. Like I'm, I'm, if I had her again, I'd love to have her come back to my house and, you know, do other things. And then I had extra material. So I got to make my granddaughter a dish and it made me feel like I, she was part of it's like she knew what I wanted. She knew what I wanted, which yeah. is good. Oh, that's and it was, good. and I like to say really thank you to my bottom of my heart from you guys for letting me come on today to show my art because you know this makes me feel that we're not we can do things with our hands even though we can't see and hear and and just thank you from my bottom of my heart because you know this is this is a great opportunity for other people to try something like this, and we can show it off and you know. You, like you, how you described it and everything else because I don't know what it looks like I really don't I just did it right well you know what it looks like in your heart yes your true. imagination Nancy and I think that that's, that's I mean I can say the same about my work Linda can say the same about her work right Linda exactly absolutely well I look I'm very much looking forward to hearing you and Louise when you come back after the live show Thank um, you. And we're in our social spaces again, being able to talk about that experience and whoever else we might learn is going to the live show because these are this this is like happened in the last couple of days that you guys have yeah. been. On so that's really <laughs> exciting. Um, thank you, Nancy, for sharing. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you once again. Um, Linda, before we move on to our next artist, I mm -hmm. wanted to maybe just chat with you a little bit about um, and Laurel can chime in if she would like to as well. But I, I you know, Nancy mentioned the the that her and, and Angie were paired up perfectly and I got the same vibe from Louise being paired with Tegan how important was it in this process for you all to make sure that those matches were like symbiotic pretty critical um you know you need to you need to be able to be comfortable with each other and you need to uh understand you know, the facilitator needs to understand when to step in and when to step back mm -hmm. and and that it is your project and really um you know knowing you know when to not try and uh, you know kind of take over which sometimes can happen right so, so doing things for us instead of with us yes exactly and and that was that's the learning piece of this that's the that's the the awareness piece of this whole process is that we don't as as blind people, we don't need people to do, most of the time we don't need people to do for us. We just need people to support us in us doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what was so critical. And it's, I'm really pleased that, and, and Laurel did a fabulous job at finding people that she thought, she interviewed all of the artists to begin with. And then she found our, uh, the facilitators that she thought would, would work well with those folks. And she did a really good job of that. Love that. All right. I think it's time to bring another artist into the space. So we're going to welcome Christy Cassie into the space. We'll get Christy's image. Well, Christy and her camera up here in a moment. I There's Christy. 
Hello. Welcome, welcome. So I'm, I'm giving all the artists an opportunity if they want to say anything to introduce their piece before we describe it. So Christy, is there something you want to share with us about your piece? Um, it's called Sunflowers for Ukraine, and I just wanted to show my support for the very unfair and unjust situation going on there, and it was just my small part. Um, yeah showing my support. So I was really happy to be able to do that. Awesome. And you are painting, what is your, what, did, what are you painting on, Christy? Uh, I'm painting on rocks. On rocks, okay. Yes, I've been painting on rocks since 2020 um, because I was bored when we had lockdown. <laughs> and uh, somebody gave me two beautiful bug, or, or rocks painted like ladybugs. And I looked at it and got, I, I think I could do that. That mm -hmm. looks simple. And then it wasn't. Um, the ladybug rocks are everywhere. I have one myself. Yeah, they're very yeah. popular. So yeah, I started painting with my fingers, and then um, my awesome facilitator found me by magic. I don't know how she found me. And she goes, okay, hold on, hold on. Before you go too deep, let's see. Right, the go, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Okay, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but this sounds no, like it's like all good. interview stuff. So let's um, let's show uh, the sunflowers for for Ukraine. Yeah, we've got a photo and we had Laurel crop it out for to a single rock so that it's nice and big for folks who are partial. Um, Laurel, can you share with us the description you wrote for this painting? Yes, um, so it's a set of rocks in a variety of sizes with sunflowers painted on the top surface. The paint is slightly raised and bumpy in the center of the flower. The petals of the flowers are yellow and the centers are brown uh, with a few spots of yellow. Awesome. Okay. We're going to talk to Christy about this. <laughs> so Christy was in the process of telling us about um, oh, rocks. So Rick, you can obsession. take the photo down for us now. Um, so uh, what, what I'm what I was able to see in that photo is is that you're not painting the whole rock. You're just painting on top of it, right? Like you're not paint. You're not putting a base color, so you, it still looks like a rock. Uh, no, it was all um, it was it's all base coated. Oh, it is so base coated. Yeah, so either um, I could do just plain white, depending on, because my vision, I, I like high contrast, yeah. but I'm tra trying to challenge myself. But anyway, so I could do solid colors, which is what we did for the sunflowers for Ukraine. Most of them are solid color backgrounds, so dark, dark backgrounds, like dark blue, dark green, dark purple, mm -hmm. so that the yellow could really pop and I could see the yellow when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm experimenting with patterns. So I'm trying to do like more authentic, like leaf patterns in the background and then do the sunflowers on top, but it's driving my eyes nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine that's the thing about partial sight is sometimes yeah. it's just, just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so. so you started talking about your facilitator um, finding you by magic. By magic. Um, do you want to tell us that story? Um, so I started painting rocks and I didn't know if I'd like it because I'm a writer. Um, I am not a visual artist. I guess I wasn't, I should say. I am now. <laughs> um, and uh, so I didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I was playing with Crayola paints, like kid paints that I could wash off. Um, but then, oh, and I was so proud, I'm like, look at all my rocks. And then the first rain came and all my rocks went back to being rocks and they had no color. And I'm like, uh, that didn't work. So I put out this post on Facebook going, how do I make paint stay on rocks? Because I, I don't know anything. And this magical person, Donna Bell, came and she said, or messaged me. And she said, if you join Rock Art Canada, I will give you a free rock painting kit. And I'm like, thank you, fairy godmother. I don't know where you appeared <laughs> from. Um, <laughs> And then I said, I'm going to be high maintenance because I, I can't see, so I can't really pick it up from wherever you are. Oh no, I'll bring it to you. Okay, thank you, fairy godmother. Uh -huh. And um, thus began the obsession. So yeah. so what what is in a rock painting kit that kit? yeah. Um, so I'm using acrylic paints so mm -hmm. the difference between like crayola is, is water-based and, and it's meant to wash off so kids can paint your walls and then mom can go <laughs> clean it off um acrylic paint my all my jeans and t-shirts 
can attest, does not even come off if you mm -hmm. wash it in the wash. Um, I have spoiled a lot of clothes in the this last This is why painters wear smocks, Christy. I, I, have sm <laughs> I, I now have smocks, yes. I do. You, have, you have clothes with paint on them that are now your painting clothes. Yeah, and, and it ended up like all my clothes were painting clothes. I had to go buy new clothes because, well, they're all painted clothes. So, um, so yes, it comes with acrylic paint and I got four primary colors, red, blue, yellow, green. And it came with a set of brushes in different um, sizes. So there's fan shaped ones. Um, there's thin like needle point ones, mm -hmm. um, basically to make different shapes. So there's all different, I don't know the technical, like they're all numbered, but they have different shapes to do different purposes. So I got the brushes, the paints, and then I got this magical thing called um sealer rock paint uh, sealer so you put it on it's like a varnish and it seals the paint so it can get wet it can get sh sunshine and it just stays glossy so you have to put that on after the paint after dries. after everything's done yeah and it make it actually makes the colors pop more the sealer when you put the sealer on everything just becomes really vibrant mm. yeah it was magic so I fell in love with that. And then I thought, I only have four colors. And I got tired of mixing like red and blue and blue and yellow. And so I went off to my dollar store and I found acrylic paints. So now I have drawers and drawers and bins and boxes. <laughs> it's too easy when, when it comes from the dollar store because it's easy to spend. Shaping over my apartment. Um, <laughs> Your studio. My, well, yeah, exactly. Your art studio. And when I started, so I knew exactly who, like I pretty much said to Laurel, I, I have my mentor already. I know who she's going to be. She ha I, I, I was like 85% sure she could do it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, but I'm like, she has to do it because she's my best. Like she has to do it. She's and very she godmother. And she showed up with a whole, like she came with a dolly, like a hand dolly with this big container of paints and she brought snacks and brushes and we just painted for four hours like our first cool. session um out on my patio so we were painting outdoors and everybody was like oh that looks like fun <laughs> it, it sounds like fun i wish i had been there because it sounds like a hoot yeah um so you started you started painting rocks and then um, and then this project came. So why did you think that that this project was the right fit, considering that you were already um, rock painting? I was not going to do it, and then you made me do it. <laughs> um, Amy made me do it. <laughs> well, no, I'm the type. You sound of like a sibling. <laughs> I I kind of like give somebody else a chance because I was already painting rocks. I knew where to get my supplies. I figured I could kind of wing it. But I'm so happy. Like, it was really cool, number one, after the pandemic, painting face-to-face. -face. Like, nobody had ever taught me to paint. So yeah. I got to sit across from somebody and go, okay, I can't see. We were working with, I think, 11 shades of yellow, and I don't see shades. No, so I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. If you say that's lemon yellow, I'll take your word for it. Because um, what happened was my flowers were looking like blobs. And it was because, and this is what Belle taught me, I was using one shade. So of course, if I did separate petals, it would just like blobby because there's nothing separating, like shades are what right. kind of separates each petal. That's the dimension. Mm, that's mm -hmm. right. So I learned to do that. And then I learned to use the different, the fan shape brush to make my petal points instead mm -hmm. of like big loopy petals, which I used to do. Um, Okay. And then I used to, I used a dotting tool, like it's a big, like a big, like stick, and it has little round balls at each end, different sizes, and you dip it in the paint and you can dot, you can make dots. So mm -hmm. that's how I did the dotted centers. Um, okay. Yeah. So Where, that well, introduced me to all those tools and, um, yeah. Where do you yeah. get the rocks? Um, well... I started buying them at this landscape place and it was 
costing me a fortune in delivery because mm -hmm. they're heavy. As you can imagine they're heavy and they sell them in 40 pound bags. So, and, and my ever so wonderful boyfriend, there's your plug, Sean, um, would have to haul in these 40 pound bags of rocks um, as, as I got them. So Belle has a pickup truck. Nice. And I said to her, I said, you know, we should go rock shopping because I, I haven't spent a lot of my money for your eyes, my vision. So we figured we'd go, we're like, okay, no matter what it costs, we have the money. So we go and Sean and Belle are picking out my rocks and we have 440 pounds of rocks now in her pickup <laughs> truck. And I'm like, wow. okay, Laurel will kill me, but <laughs> she said I could use the budget and I'll just send her the, the receipt. And I get the bill, 50 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 10 cents a pound. Yeah. I'm like, this is the best hobby ever. <laughs> how, how, big are, how big are the rocks? They're, oh, Christy. they're very in size. And I think my boyfriend was choosing the biggest ones just for fun. <laughs> so and they're, then, they're, they're door stops. Yeah. And that well, and then Belle was choosing, like, there's all different. She was looking for things that look like potatoes, or we found ones that look like hearts. Um, so there's a, I have everything from small, like pebbles, to big boulder type now christy you also i know this because i i i you gifted me a rock to put in my neighborhood which i did yeah. um yeah. what tell me tell us what you put underneath the rock so i actually hashtag it i'm a big social media person because why not promote beautiful projects like this um so i have two hashtags two no three three hashtags for this project so i have hashtag your eyes my vision it's all one word, but each word has a capital. So your yep. eyes, my vision. And then I have Christy Cassie rocks. Ha <laughs> ha. I thought that was fun. Um, Cause I do rock. Cause you rock. Christy, <laughs> Christy Cassie rocks. And then I have sunflowers for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So you can use any of those hashtags to um, check out. Like I, I, I log all my progress from, I think we started July 20 or July 12th and um yeah so people who pick them up in the world can like um find yeah. you on social media and look up the project no but yeah nobody's actually told now i've had people who's told me they found them like in person mm -hmm. but nobody's actually used a tag to like to say i found this rock in this place yeah interesting yeah. very cool but a newspaper person did find me and, and interviewed me so we got some newspaper coverage for the project um August 31st, we were featured in the new West record, um, Belle and me for my sunflowers project. So I was oh, really wait. glad the project got some, some. Yeah. Way things. to go to be a self promoter, but I suppose, you know, being a social media person, you know how to do these things. I am bad at these things. Very, very bad. <laughs> uh, things fall into my lap. I think cause like I was walking down, like I live in New Westminster and I'm walking down by the fireworks, by the boardwalk, and somebody goes, hey, you're the sunflower girl. I'm like, what? Wow. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then my, Sean goes, I think she's talking to you. I'm like, oh, yeah, right, maybe. Right. Maybe. <laughs> um, so I'm known. I don't know. Somebody who's seen you paint your rocks on your patio. Well, as they I leave them in public places. Like, I've left ones in Ikea, in Coquitlam, and I left... I actually left ones at the theater, like in the aisle, like just tucked in the corner. And I left one in the Metrotown bathroom and somebody wanted to pay me for it. And cool. like, yeah, I do like, I just leave them. Like I want to make people smile. I so, think you're doing that. I got a smile. Linda's got a smile. I think yeah. you're doing that. So, there you go. I could talk on and on, but that's my- Well, you're going to join us back on. at the Q&A. And at that yep. point, you know- And I hope to be in questions. Victoria. I just have to figure out transport. We'll, we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk. Cool. Very godmother number two. <laughs> the stars have aligned. I love this. I love this very much. So um, thank you. Your chance. Thank you, Christy Cassie, for joining us in the space with your rocks for uh, for Ukraine, the sunflowers for Ukraine. So um, they're quite they're quite beautiful to look at. So thanks for sharing them with us. All right, um, Linda, we're going to go ahead and invite in our fourth um, 
artist in the space. Uh, and that is going to be Josie. So Josie, yeah, jo oh, there's, I, I see a camera. I see somebody. I don't think that's Josie though. That might be uh, <laughs> Josie's other half. Mute me, yeah. I muted. Yeah, we can hear you. There you go. Oh, hi. <laughs> ah, <laughs> success. Technology works and it's great when it does. And when it doesn't, we. Oh, you have, betcha. <laughs> we have a sob in the corner, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, Josie, you had a project called uh, Thumper, Guardian of yes. the Sea. Um, mm -hmm. Anything you want to say just to introduce it before we show the image? Um, just that it's. Um that I've had a connection to the sea my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, brought up, you know, all summer on a beach with sea animals and things and moved to this coast. Um, and it was 30 years, we we're close to the water and lots of connection with um, all the sea life in the bay. And um, yeah, and then we found a retirement home and there's the sea lions on the dock on TV just next door. And I'm thinking, oh man, sea lions all over the place. The universe <laughs> so, is telling you something, right? I think so. They're just all around me. So um, it's my so, connection with that. I love it. Um, let's bring up the image and we'll hear the description and then we'll talk through it just like we've done with our other guests. So um, uh, we've got the image up. So Laurel, you're gonna give us an image description. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is a sculpture that is seven by 11 inches at the base and is eight inches tall and consists of a mottled gray and cream piece of soapstone that has been carved to resemble a sea lion. Sea lion is resting on a block of the same stone with his head looking up and to his left. The tail curls around his left side. The soapstone sits on a fishing net with scattered debris tangled up in the net. The objects in the net include a large piece of driftwood, some shells and stones, a couple of elastic bands, a container of dental floss, and two small empty plastic bottles. Mm. I can already feel the theme coming through on this one. Mm -hmm. um, Laurel, just before you, we take the image down, what is the color of the, of the sandstone? Soapstone, sorry. Uh, it's gray and cream, it's mottled. It's great. So can you just, for folks who don't know what mottled means, can you yes. maybe explain that? Um, yeah, it's a uh, hmm, excellent question. I'm trying to think of like marbled or like a combination of both gray and cream kind of like blotches. So has it got like a, a base color of kind of gray and then like veins of cream coming through it? Yeah, that's that's a better way of describing it, yes. Very, very natural stone. So I imagine if we had a geologist in the space, they'd probably talk about the different <laughs> minerals that were intersecting the stone. So uh, that, that changed these colors. So thank you for the description. Um, all right, Josie. You're up, my friend. So you talked about being at the beach. Sorry, Rick, you can take down the photo now. Um, you talked about being on a beach lover and a, and a water lover. Um, mm -hmm. Are you also, do you also identify with being an artist? Or for you, was this like, hmm, I just want to give something a try? Um, well, I, I guess I've toyed with things in my past, you know, like I would create my own projects. Like I would sneak into my mom's sewing room and take the scraps and make Barbie doll clothes with them. I did so the I don't know thing. if that qualifies as an it artist. It qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's kind of the stuff I used to do. And I, I've made, I've never done something quite this line or this, this quite artistic, I should say. You know, I've done lots of knitting and crocheting and pom-pom pets back in the day when they were the thing and, mm -hmm. um, you know, shaping that way, but never shaping with actual tools and you were in, you were involved in tactile art as well oh, in right. Victoria. Yeah. Yes. Ah. That oh, was awesome too. So yeah. wh why soapstone? Um, soapstone. Um, I was toying between wood or soapstone, and I felt like soapstone would be a bit friendlier to work with mm -hmm. and more manageable. I thought. And I had seen some soapstone worked like um, some people around me had worked with it before. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that would be like. I could never do that. There's just no way. That's too complicated. Uh, no way. It would just end up like one big blob or something. So 
um, thought, well, here's an opportunity. I've been given this gift and uh, let's give it a try. Maybe I'll learn. And I was looking for a pastime too, like recently retired. And, you know, it's nice to be outside and have something to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so. um, when you were working with your facilitator, uh, maybe you can give us a bit about, you know, like was Soapstone their primary medium that they worked with? Um, yes. and, and what was it like to use that medium for the first time? Okay. Um, all right. Um, my, my tutor was a soapstone carver. She's actually a teacher. She'll teach. And I thought, okay, this is why I thought this might work for me. She, she says, I teach kids too. So, <laughs> okay. This will work. This will work. I can fit in there. I'm sure. She said, anybody can do this. So I thought, okay, yeah, let's give it a try. And, um, so you asked what, if she was an actual yeah so it sounds like she's she knows her way around a piece of soapstone she actually does big time like we went to her place the first like she said she would come here or we could go there but I thought let's go there so we get a feel of because I wasn't too sure if I was going to end up working with this medium exactly so I wanted to get a right. good um, good out you know good outlook and see what it's all about and it turns out that she was exposed to carving wood too as a youngster and her mom used to carve wood all the time and um, yeah so her mom had a visual impairment so she had a connection to what my needs might be as well mm -hmm. so um, yeah when she she showed me lots of different pieces and I could feel them and see what they were like and uh, I had big ideas, right? Oh, I want to do um, the theme that you saw in the picture, like this, the beach and how sea animals are at risk um, because of our environment, because of the things we do, um, you know, the um, things we throw away. And we sailed for many years too, so there's lots of debris in the water. And, mm -hmm. and every time you see this, you know that um, they're going to be curious and they're going to go and possibly eat it. And yeah. so, you know, I thought, oh, I wanted to do a, a sculpture and a carving. And I thought maybe we could carve the other side and show all the things in the stomach, you know, all the things. That oh, the yes, stomach. I hear you. I hear you. Oh, and yeah. You realize it's not really something you can do. <laughs> like she's going, I think you've bit off more than you can chew with this yeah. idea. So I thought, OK, well, let's she was great, though. She said, you know, let's try something simple. So she sent me home with a couple of small pieces. And away we went, you know, with, uh, we got some tools and um, I was a bit discouraged at first because she said, oh, you get them in garage sales and you go to yard sales. And I thought, oh dear, that's not going to be an easy task. So we did buy some, you know, we got going, but uh, now we have quite the collection because every time we saw a yard sale, we're pulling in and going like, I had to get some tools and lots of people. Yeah. So Josie, so yeah, Josie, ahead, it, yeah, I was just going to say, is it like chisels and hammers? Yeah, is that what kind how of you do it? Okay, yeah, okay. Tools, uh, the, you start with that, okay? The okay. chisel and the hammer, because you got a rock, right? A stone, just um, a shape. A slab, so, yeah. And we were a bit limited because of the pandemic, too, because of the availability of uh, soapstone, too. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't that many pieces that were large, um, but she had some things in, in her little treasure box so um we we did find a piece that was big to work with and we could do some sea life so um sorry what was your question again <laughs> just <laughs> asking about the tools oh the tools yeah tools okay use. yeah so we bought the the four basic ones that she gave us a list and we could go get those the four basic ones to get started i mean she was talking about a rat tail and i'm going like you know when you can't see and she's holding this thing and i'm going like no, I'm not working with no rat tail. That's not happening. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I so don't even know what that is. Well, it's a rasp. They're called rasps, all the different ones. And then there's um, one that's called a needle. And it's sort of rounded, which mm -hmm. I love working with that one because, you know, you can sort of like not make a big mistake. And then there's um, some that are in the shape of a triangle. So you can really make a groove and get inside and make angles and create like uh, down by around where the uh, the creature is sitting like you know and when you're doing the toes the feet like when you're making those grooves you need to have like the angled um, rasps for those ones yeah 
But when you're doing the chiseling, like to get the, the stone that it's sitting on separated from where the, the sea lion is going to sit and how the whole shape of it, that you need to go at it with a chisel and um, a mallet. So you're chipping away at this rock and trying to create it. <laughs> does it take so, does it take much does it take much or is it just a, a little tap and it, it chips off is it a very soft stone it this one was not and it depends on the amount of i think i was reading it's talc t -A -L -C, uh, that's within it like it's it's like i guess it's used for countertops too like and it's a different density of the, mm. the stone for like things in your house, like sinks and countertops, et cetera, or pots and pans and stoves. But for carving, this would be a higher percentage of that in there. So it would make it softer, which brings me to some of the other tools were like, oh, you'll need gloves and you'll need a mask. <laughs> and go like, okay, oh. kind of got used to those two things during pandemic, but being blind and holding on to um, like tools with your fingers and gloves on, it totally robbed me of my sense of touch. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't, she said, well, you're just gonna have some war wounds. And I did have war wounds, but I was <laughs> feeling better about the war wounds than knowing that, uh, cause once she would help me with the sculpting, cause that's, it's, it is kind of hard to do. She's strong. I couldn't believe it because I wasn't strong enough to get some of those angles in. Like she had to tip it sideways and she'd be contorting and banging away. And then she goes, okay, you do it. And I'm like, okay. Wow. But yeah, it, it's, uh, you need other eyes. Like when the project has a good title because I needed a pair of eyes for that type of thing. Yeah. And what, tell us a story about the the net and the the bottle and the things that you had uh, that, that the sea lion is sitting on or around him. Yeah, or... well, that that <laughs> we decided to create. Like I had the idea to do it all in soapstone to begin with, but again, you know, it's it's a much larger piece which were not available. So we thought, oh, let's create our own scene. We go to the beach all the time, so we had some beach excursions and collected some driftwood and the meshing, like that's, that's um, you know, from fishing boats and they can get tangled up in that. And then they're totally helpless. You know, they just can't uh, manage their their flappers and they, they get all tangled into the mesh and they can't function as, um, as to go get their food, et cetera, and maneuver in the water. So that's a big problem. And the other thing is with the bottles, well, they never disintegrate, right? The plastic is there forever and ever. And some of these tops, like one of the one I chose in particular, it's like just a small top, but it's like those um, juice boxes or protein drinks, they're sealed on the top. So the little top that you turn, it's got three sharp, sharp prongs in there. So if they're curious and pick one of those up in their mouth and swallow oh, it, no. it's going to rip and tear things along their mm. alimentary tract too, and you know get stuck in their stomach and cause all kinds of damage. Right. So there's a lot of things for us to think about in, you know, going to the beach, because those things are all things we need to pack back in our little backpack and take them home. And I think dispose like of them. any artist and. What all of our artists are doing in this space is they're saying something with their work, which really, it really means something to me as an artist to be able to have an inspiration and to say something with the work. Josie, where does this work live now? This work lives, um, well, it's right here on my table today. So it's, um, it's going to be on our mantle at some point, mm -hmm. but it's going to go visit an art show in Victoria as well. <laughs> oh, okay. be on display as well. Yeah. And there's, there's things like when you're making this too, like those little tiny ears, like I can remember um, Kate saying, now those little ears are pretty delicate and we don't want to, because there's stages of um, rubbing, like, you know, when you're working with your stone, your stone after the chiseling, it's rub, rub, rub. Like I could do it in my dream. Like I kept repeating this in my head, like rub, rub, rub. Because there's like five different stages of sandstone and different meshing that you use to work the stone so that it brings out all the little um, 
uh, features within the stone. And then you go to steel wool and there's three levels of that steel wool. You start with a very coarse and then you work to a very fine. And then at the very end, we get, um, we get it to the point where it's done and you bake it in your oven at like 130 degrees, just a very low, low heat, but the stone heats right up. And then you put wax all over it. It's a clear wax, it's called kiwi wax. Yeah, you can get it like at London Drug or any other places. And then you let that dry and then you get a very soft cloth and you rub, rub, rub again. And that brings out all those little uh, spots that you see in the, um, in the finished project. I can't see them, but my yeah. husband was saying, oh yeah, all of a sudden we're seeing more colors and more lines and more um, features, which is all the minerals that are deposited within yeah. the stone, right? Yeah. Well, it's quite a, a beautiful piece and it, it's amazing to me how, um, even from with, with my small amount of partial, I can, I can make out the shape of the sea lion. Um, and I didn't lose the ears. I was so afraid yeah. to lose the ears, you know, because they're so tiny and they're, they're little pups, you know, and they're such yeah. big animals. I mean, they're thousands of pounds and, and um, you know, they make such noises and they, they wallow around in the water and, and they got these little ears, little, like little puppy dog ears kind of thing. And so the ears are a little bit tiny on this thing. And I kept thinking, oh, I'm going to rub one off and I'll be so upset. But that didn't happen. Well, if you had rubbed one off, you would have had to have come up with a really unique story about the fact that the sea lion like got into a fight with a wal walrus or something. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll go with that. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you, Josie, for sharing this. I wish you the best of luck in terms of the live gallery. I think that that's, I mean, I'm so excited for you all that are able to go. I'm so sad I'm not available, but alas, um, you know. It's not going to fit in everybody's calendars, but I'm going to be sending my love to you all who is who are presenting at the gallery space. So really excited about well, that. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to. Yeah, of course. This makes a lot of sense, right? We want to be able to share with our community what our community has made. I think it's mm -hmm. lovely. Thanks, Josie. Okay. Um, Linda, who's our next guest? I think, dot, it, dot, might, dot. I think it might I think be it me. might be you. <laughs> I mean, b before we get into our piece, I wonder if there's any reflections on what we've learned so far from our artists in the space. Wow, well, I'm learning an awful lot, uh, just in all these different, you know, mediums, art mediums, and, and how interesting, exciting they are. So yeah, yeah, yeah. getting lots of ideas <laughs> Well, in, in all my spare time. I know, right? I'm feeling the same way. It's like, oh, now I want to do some rock painting. Oh, now I want to play with some clay. Oh, oh soapstone sounds interesting. Um, you're right. There's so many things to do and not enough hours in the day to be able to do it all. Yeah. It's the FOMO. It's the artistic FOMO. The fear of missing out. Oh, right, right. The artistic FOMO. Um, well, since you're our next artist in the space, is there anything that you would like to share? Because both you and I, you and I are doing back to back because you'll interview me for my art right after we do you. Um, there's an audio component, so I I, I want to just front load this because we're going to play it with the image up. So maybe oh, you're going to play it at the same time as the image. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're going to put the image up, describe it, and then play the. Uh... Got it. Okay. So I I just like to introduce it because yes. the the audio component is um, a poem that I wrote. Um, probably 20, 25 years ago. I'll tell you more about it after. Um, so the painting was sort of, um, I, 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 and I've never shared either this, either the poetry and I've never done art before and shared it with the public. So, but I thought it's about time. <laughs> and so I, um, I thought, yeah, I'd like to, to do the painting uh, to accompany the, the, the um, the, the poem. Awesome. Um, I'm excited to share it with our friends in the space. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring up Linda's painting. And then um, Laurel's going to do the description. And after Laurel's done the description, we'll leave the painting up and we'll play the audio file with Linda's poem. So Laurel, would you please do the description for us? Yes. Um, this is a 20 by 24 inch acrylic painting entitled Shades of Grey. 
On the left side, halfway up the canvas is a raised silhouette of a woman sitting on a very large rock facing to the right, overlooking the ocean. She has her knees drawn up and her arms wrapped around her knees. Above her are raised silhouetted tree branches with sparse leaves presumably extending from a tree which is not seen in the painting. She sits gazing at a far out island painted in a transparent textured misty gray. The sky is a similar light gray, but flat and featureless. Each of the other elements of the painting are a different shade of gray and each has a significant texture. The ocean has a blue gray wavy pattern. The beach in the lower right corner is a rough sandy gray and the rock which takes up the entire lower left quadrant is an undulating dark gray. Ooh, I'm totally getting shades of gray. So Rick, go ahead and play the poem. Before me, the variegated water ripples, then roars. A dark shadow, mist, mountain, mirage, looms beyond the eagle's cry. Or perhaps it's only a whisper away. Above the blue, gray mottled sky is broken by dark floating feathered birds dancing, stealing the sun. Beneath the gray moonscape, cold, unyielding, unrevealing. I sit, unmoving, unmoved, numb. Wow, Linda, that was really nice to listen to. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rick. You can take the image down. Um, reflecting on on that, so you said you wrote this poem like twenty plus years ago. I did um, during a time when my vision was going, and I was losing color perception, and I was feeling a little sorry for myself. And everything was turning into shades of gray. The color was going. And um, I, I used the poetry at the time sort of as a, I guess it was my therapy. And um, to deal with situations that I found myself in when I, I was feeling kind of isolated and alone and apart from everybody else who was busy looking at and, and enjoying the world visually. And yeah, so that was sort of what inspired the, the poem. And I wrote a few at the time. And so maybe there'll be more paintings in the future that go with those. Um, and then I thought, well, this would be a really interesting uh, thing to put into a painting and just play with, you know, sort of gray and, and shades of gray for everything in the painting, because that's what I was seeing at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that is actually me sitting up on a rock where uh, when I thought about this poem and gazing out over the ocean and not really knowing what I was looking at, but being aware that there were things out there. And um, yeah, so it was, uh, I was really excited to be able to put this down on canvas. I've wanted to paint for a long time and, and wanted to find a, a way to do it. Um, I was uh, partnered with a, a lovely young man called Blue, and he came and just kind of went with the flow, whatever I was wanting to try or experiment with. And we, we tried all sorts of different techniques uh, in order to, to make this possible for me to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the one who introduced me to this medium. It's kind of like a gel, and you can paint it over top of what you've painted already, or you can mix it with the paint. And they these various um, um, type, various, you know, products, they're, they're all the same product, but, but they have different, they dry with different textures. And I wanted my painting to be tactile. So it is tactile, it's quite tactile. So I'm really looking forward to the live show where people can actually feel it and, and, and uh, feel what 
what I'm describing in my poem and right. what's up there on the canvas. The difference between the tree and the rock and the yeah, the they're all and the water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, so so, and I the, the the piece of the process that I wasn't sure how to do was I thought, well, how am I you know how am I going to stay with stay in the lines right mm -hmm. <laughs> like when you can't see the lines and and I didn't want to paint mind you acrylics very forgiving and you can paint over if you've you've gone gone where you didn't want to go you can paint over it but I um so we experimented with a, a variety of um uh, materials to see if we could create you know sort of a tactile line that that would create the shape and I could then paint within the, the lines the raised lines and we found the best thing that worked for us was good old, you know, the pages are uh, uh, glue. Uh, it dries clear and it peels off if you don't want to keep it there. And it's very easy to feel and it's fairly easy to apply. So I would um, use my finger and draw a shape on the, on the canvas that I was thinking of. And then glue would uh, sketch that with a pencil and then he'd go around and create the shape with the glue and then um, I could then paint within that to create the the shape I was looking for um, I didn't I didn't paint the, the person myself I didn't paint that that was a little bit too tricky so he actually painted that for me but I I sat on the floor and I and I I was his model and I said this is what I want you to show I uh, you know I sat on the floor with my knees pulled up and I and I had a hat on and um, said this is this is the figure I want in in the painting so the uh, the tree the tree limbs and the little sort of feathery leaves are all raised so you can feel those uh, the sand has a coarse texture to it the ocean is kind of wavy I took um. Uh, a, um, I think it was a plastic fork, and just ran it across the uh, across the wet uh, ma um, material and created these sort of waves, and it dried with a you know a wavy pattern on it. So, um, yeah, I really I was so excited every time that he came over to to do it. It was uh, it was so much fun, and I um, I painted with my fingers. I, I didn't want anything between my hand and the canvas. I wanted to feel what I was doing. So I wore a glove on my left hand, my right hand, and that was the one I painted with. And my left hand, um, I used that to just sort of feel the, the, the raised line so that I was oriented to where I was painting. And I just spread the paint with my fingers. So a wonderful kind of tactile experience. <laughs> of spreading all, all these different textures and what have you. It sounds like a lot of drying time. Oh, it was a lot of drying time. And I was time. saying, and you were saying that Blue came over, like every time Blue came over. So how long did this process take? Uh, it probably took about five or six visits. Because yeah. um, we, we first of all, we started just experimenting and, and I, had a, I had a practice canvas, which somebody said that looks like a piece of art as well as well where we just tried all sorts of things to see what would work mm -hmm. and and then um but it does you know you do have to let things dry before you can do the next stage and as I did the different colors I would do you know one color and then let, let that dry and he'd come back and um do another uh you know we do another uh, session I was also doing another project at the same time which I haven't finished um, and it was a COVID related thing. It was a, a model that I was creating with tactile color, which I mentioned before with Josie. And I have all this tactile color I wanted to use for something. So whether that'll ever come to fruition, because I kind of feel like I want to leave COVID behind now. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started it, I had this concept of doing this, this model with um, tactile color. And so we would work on that when we were waiting for the paint to dry, <laughs> literally. So, um, yeah, so he must have come five or six times. And would you say then, you know, you said you always wanted to paint. Mm -hmm. um, what other, I mean, you talked about tactile color, but what other kinds of things were you doing before painting? Because you have you you've been expressing yourself as an artist before. Uh, well, I've I, not so much. Well, I, I I've done a little bit with the tactile art and made you know kind of gift gift cards and things like that. But um, 
I haven't really done a lot of visual art. I've always felt that I, 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 I think I mentioned this the last time I learned that it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to look realistic. It doesn't have to be perfect. And that was always my concept was that, you know, there's all these techniques and, and um, ways that you're supposed to do art and, you know, people are judged on that. And I thought, well, that's what I can't do that, you know, but, and then I tur it turned out, no, that isn't what it's about at all. It's nothing to do with, re well, it's, it is to do with what you see, but, but it's really, it's really, you don't, you don't, you don't um, appreciate art with your eyes, you appreciate with your mind. So it's, it's more the, the, um, the concepts, the, the message you're trying to put across the, you know, the combinations of, of colors and textures and um, yeah, that, that really um, is what counts. So I didn't, I didn't used to think of myself as an artist. I do now. <laughs> so oh, I love that. And, and I, I've done performing art in the past and I love to sing. I've been in choirs and things like that, but not, and, and I've been on the stage a little bit, but not uh, visual art. So um, this painting um, is my first and I sure hope it won't be my last. <laughs> and where is it living, Linda? It's right now downstairs in my studio. <laughs> oh, you have a studio, I'm so well, I, I have a spare, it's a half of a garage that's that's sort of it's finished but not not uh, it's rough finished it's a studio that's all that it's matters a studio yeah. <laughs> so it's hanging I'm on the wall down there because uh, i have to get you know proper wire and hanging so i can actually hang it up um you know on a hook somewhere in the rest of the house but right now it's on a nail in the wall and i don't want to put a nail elsewhere so <laughs> cool. but yeah. your, your you had your your boys around for the holidays did they see it what did they say about it um I, my, my older son had seen it as I was working on it. He is a bit of an artist. M my father was an artist and my, my oldest son is quite artistic as well. And, you know, I don't really remember what he said. You know, there were, we're not necessarily. Well, then it can't have been bad. Because oh, no. you oh, remember he never, that. He would have never said it was bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I don't think I showed it to my younger one. I perhaps did. I, you know, I'm very, I'm very shy. Uh, about my art um, I'll get better at that I think but um, I'm not really one to be showing it off a lot but I do plan to put it in my living room so people will comment and see it awesome I love that yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for for sharing shades of gray I think it's a beautiful piece and I really enjoyed listening to the accompanying poem I but want to just tell you a little yeah. bit about just doing that so um, I, I, I memorized the poem because I'm not very good at reading Braille quickly and I can't see, you know, to read it. And so I memorized it and I thought, well, I'll use good old Google Home and ask her to play. She'll probably start playing right now, right. Uh, you know, play the sound of the ocean. And I thought, that's it. That's perfect. Now all I have to do is put on my iPhone and record you know my google home and me saying it and the poem and i thought well this will take a few takes well the first take i thought i don't think i'm going to do any better than that so um yeah you know i said at the end oh gosh now how do i turn this silly iphone off <laughs> but um, blue was able i think it was blue did it he was able to edit it for me so that um didn't have any of my commentary in the background so that was a little bit of, that was my first sort of foyer, of, what's the word, not foyer. Um, anyways, my first adventure, dalliance, dalliance I guess, into kind of audio art. Love it. Yeah. Um, I've been experimenting with, with recording some of my poetry for a while. Um, and it's tricky because I'm not an editor. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to, trying to be as stealth as possible with my own tools so that it, you know, it has kind of a, a not so shocking beginning or end, but you know, it's a work in progress. So, well, I think, I think we're so fortunate nowadays that we've got technology at our fingertips that allows us to do this without having to go out and, you allows know, play. go into a studio, allows us to play at least, you know? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Shades of Grey is a, a lovely piece of painted artwork and you should be very proud. All of our artists in this space, I'm sure uh, should be very proud because it's all really great work. Um, who's our next artist, Linda? 
So our next artist is our one and only Amy. And Ooh. Amy, yeah, Amy. <laughs> and um, so Amy, do you have anything you'd like to share to introduce the piece? Sure. Um, I will say that um, I called this piece um, Flame of Fire. And it is a piece of uh, glass. I did glass blowing. And when you presented um, your eyes, my vision, I thought I've always wanted to glass blow and nobody in all my research, nobody had ever wanted to take on a blind person to, to glass blow because it was just too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Um, so I thought, well, here's the opportunity. Let's give it a try. So this is a, a piece of glass, one of three, but we're only showing you one of them. And um, I guess Laurel can bring up the image. I also have a poem. I also have a poem. So I, now Linda and I were on the same wavelength and we both had poems <laughs> created. And it was like, wow, that's interesting. So we're going to do exactly the same process. Laurel's going to describe and then uh, and then Rick's going to play the poem. So go ahead, Laurel. All right. Um, so it's a piece of Smith solidified molten glass titled Playing with Fire. Uh, this is a sculpture made of clear orange and yellow glass that swirls throughout the piece. The piece is about a forearm long and two to three inches wide with a twist in the middle with various knobs of glass that stick out throughout the piece, but mostly towards the two ends. And Rick's gonna hit play. There is no ember, but rather an intensity that never ceases, an emblazing inferno that keeps me awake at night. The scorching torturer, a smoldering beholding of the senses that scolds the soul. Nope, not today you won't. Constantly fearing the searing sensation of a caustic burn with a yearning to overmedicate knowing I should titrate so that my brain can still collate. But instead, I feel the excruciating blistering of a red-hot poker stabbing me over and over, creating the feeling like I'm walking on fire. It's no outlier, but my brain has crossed its wires, leaving me in a pain that's dire. Every step, a strain, but I don't want to live my life in vain. The pain is with me all day long and has no respect for rest, nor does it abide by my request for subsistence. I ignore and move on with my day to be that happy cliche, not wanting the world to know that I am caught in the fray with no relief or delay on flesh that feels like it's been filleted. Okay, wow. Rick, we can take that down now. <laughs> oh, Amy, yeah. <laughs> did you jump into the molten vat of, of fire? <laughs> I'll tell you, yeah, I, it, I, it feels like I do. So I'll tell you that, um, oh my gosh, it feels weird being in the opposite seat. So yes, it does. <laughs> um, my, so when I embarked on this glass blowing adventure, my Benji, my facilitator said to me, you know, he said, do you play an instrument? And I said, no. And he said, okay, well, like pick an instrument. I, I like the violin. He said, okay, so let's say you're going to learn to play the violin. What do you think that you'll, you'll be able to do after your first class? And I said, I don't know, maybe hold it properly, right? Like, what can you do? You're not going to compose a song um, after your first violin class. So he said, well, that's what glass blowing is. So he says, you're not going to come out with a vase or a plate or a dish or a pendant or a, you're going to come out with a chunk of glass that, that you've played with. And I said, okay. And he said, so before you come into the space, he said, we'll play with three pieces, like three, um, we'll do it three times. Before you come in, bring in an emotion, bring in a memory, bring in something to work with when you're playing with the glass. And so I was thinking about, and that's why I wrote this poem was what I'm gonna bring into the space. And for me, I thought, well, I would like to be able to put into molten glass, what diabetic neuropathy feels like when I walk. Oh because I've been living with diabetic neuropathy for 15 years and nobody sees that on me. They see the blindness, but my invisible disability is the pain in walking every day, every moment. I, even as I'm sitting in this chair, I can feel like there's fire underneath my feet. So that's what I brought into the space was the, the, the creation of this poem. And we played with glass with this sort of running in my, in my brain. 
Wow, interesting. So, um, what pieces were, what part of the process were you able to do and what part were you not able to do? Because I, I can't imagine working with, working with melted glass and all this heat and everything um, and not being able to touch. <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, it's, I was too, I was like, it's a question mark for me. And when I walked into the space, I said to Benji, it's a question mark for me. I don't know. Um, and so they have uh, an oven where there is molten glass that lives there. And, you know, it was funny that Benji was saying to me, he said, you know, it costs me more money and electricity than anything else, because you can't ever turn that, that, that furnace off. Because once the glass oh. cools, it shatters, right? It, it, you can't reheat it the same way. So it needs to be kept at a constant temperature so that it's always molten. Um, and you can think of it kind of, I think of it kind of like, like Vaseline, uh, but in a hot glass kind of way, but that mm -hmm. kind of viscosity. And so they take a long, um, uh, like six foot pole, think of like the length of a, a pool cue. Um, and it's made of metal and you stick it in the furnace and you gather up glass like cotton on the end of a q-tip and it comes out and, and you're sitting on a bench you don't actually stand when you're glass blowing you sit on a bench <clears throat> like a piano bench and it's made of wood and it's got two metal arms so you don't use those to set your arm on you use those to set the long hot rod on and the mm -hmm. rod rolls and the gravity pulls the glass and you grab the glass with like long tweezers or different tools and move the glass around um and then you can stop and you can blow in the end of the tube and sort of um you know change its shape but that's the idea and then you know you have to kind of heat it up just a little bit because it starts to get cool so quickly that you can't manipulate it anymore and it's already really hard to manipulate um so then they stick it in what's called a glory hole of all things and it's it's a flame that just sort of heats it up a little bit and then you come back out and you do the process again and again and again and at some point they have these little tiny chips they come in different sizes but think of them like either the size of a grain of rice or like um, flour powder or like the size of a, a kidney bean right different sizes and they're basically chips of colored glass which um, they're not, there's a whole scientific thermal dynamic explanation around the fact that they're not really colored glass. It's a thermal uh, thing that happens when, when heat and, and elements, whatever, but it looks like pieces of bits of colored glass. Okay. Um, and you lay those out on a metal table and you literally take this hot molten glass and you roll it. And you have no control over what the color is going to be or how it's gonna look like or how it's gonna appear in the glass because you can't see it until the end. Uh, uh -huh. because everything when you pull it out of the the fire in the hole is piping red so you can't see what it's going to look like right so so it's it, it, it that to we're not in a at a disadvantage with that part of it no every, every artist that does glass blowing experiences the same thing from that perspective so yeah. they are not 100 percent. i guess they can learn the techniques and and eventually can perhaps they have an idea of what it might come out like but not they never know for sure yeah did yeah did uh, how did you find somebody who would actually take you on <laughs> well laurel laurel sent me a little email saying that i should check out um this guy on granville island and um and it was i mean it was really hard to get a hold of him because he's so busy um that he it took forever for us to get a hold of so it was like i don't know six or seven months after i'd been put in touch with him that i actually got to to go in and and spend three hours three and a half hours um and and do these three pieces of of glass that are now in my house um and i thought you know this is those funny anecdote things so like at the 11th hour the day before um i got an email from benji that said okay we'll see you tomorrow at uh, two o'clock and wonderful and he said don't forget to wear cotton pants wear clothes with cotton in them. And I was like, what? I don't have <laughs> like cotton is like, you can't, it's hard to find cotton. And I wear a lot of like spandex and probably like rayon and like synthetic fibers, but cotton is, is if for whatever reason, there is glass that lands on you or flame, it doesn't like catch on fire the same way. It doesn't, yeah. And, and doesn't, burn to your it skin. It doesn't melt, yeah. It doesn't melt the same way. So mm -hmm. I was like the day before I was hunting, I was like, okay, you know, so I'm, I, I, my, my body shape doesn't fit into like your typical store. So it wasn't just like I could walk in and buy a pair of jeans. Um, so I was looking in department stores. I, I literally spent a day trying to find a pair of pants and all I could find was a pair of purple plaid pajama pants <laughs> that were way too big for me. But I was like, whatever, I'll pin them. 
So I did. So there was me on a September day, the hottest, one of the hottest days of the year in September, walking through Granville Island in a pair of purple pajama, flannel, cotton pants. And it was so hot. And I get there and Benji's in t-shirts and a shorts and pair of shorts. And I'm like, what the heck? You told me to wear cotton. Um, <laughs> but he gave me Kevlar sleeves and everything. And it was good. And, and really the only thing that I couldn't do um, or that I didn't feel comfortable doing, I would say on my first day, was grabbing the the glass out of the, the kiln and then putting it in the, in the glory hole. But everything else I did. And, um, and it was really very um very interesting very hot you're sweating all the time um and you're on your feet all the time so it was I was in it was hot and I was in pain and but I did it I did it and I loved every moment of it and did he did he um share with you um you know his experience or what he thought you know because he's probably never worked with somebody who's blind before so did he share any of that with you did he yeah 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 yeah, I mean, on our first on our first meeting that, that well, our, our only meeting, we spent a, probably a good half an hour just chatting through stuff. And one of the things he said was, um, you know, we we have to constantly communicate while we're in the space because there's like hot there's hot stuff around us all the time. And I said, oh, well, you don't have to worry about that with me because I'll be the person who's like, can I touch this? Can I not touch this? Can I stand over here? Can I move? Like, it'll start to get, it'll start to get redundant <laughs> for you. And he said, that's exactly what we need because the last thing we need is for me to move to a different spot and for him to swing the molten glass and hit me in the face because he thinks I was somewhere and I think I was somewhere else, right? right? So we actually worked really, really well together. And I think the biggest the biggest thing for him was was managing my expectations of what I was going to be able to create. Right. Right. Yeah. Because he's like, if you come in here thinking you're coming out with a vase, I'm telling you, you're not gonna. <laughs> it's like it's a good thing that I came into this with no expectations. I really just wanted to play. And he he invited a new technique that he's always wanted to try and thought, I wonder what this would be like. So you wear a pair of like oven mitts that have um like like the of glove kind of thing or like um silicone oven mitts, but yes. silicone is not enough to keep from burning through your skin. So wow. they do this technique where they take newspaper and it's really just, it's the newsprint. So it doesn't have the ink on it and they layer it. And it's been, it's been made wet over several days. So it's not sopping wet, but it's, it's wet and compact, not dripping in any way, but it's damp. And so we put the oven mitts inside this folded um, uh, uh, newsprint. And when the glass came out, I would hold it in my hands and try and push it um, like you would push clay. It didn't really change the shape of the glass very much. But what was interesting was when I took my hands away, the newsprint paper was burnt to a crisp, but in a really cool pattern because it's because the different parts of it were touching different parts of the hot glass. Right. So it's like this really light brown colored newsprint with dark brown colored burnt char on it which was really cool so benji and i were like that's really cool but he did never you tried did you keep before. did you keep it no because it you know it disintegrates after time because it's oh. it's wet so right uh, that's hilarious no i i didn't i told <laughs> but it was interesting you know, yes yeah so do you think that he would entertain um someone else uh if they if somebody felt so inclined that they wanted to try this. Um, I know that it was quite expensive. And yeah, so, yeah, it cost $500 for three hours. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Plus I'm so that. glad we, 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 could, we could make that happen for you. I know, me too. Yeah, it was a real, a real gift. And um, now I just have to figure out how I'm going to dust these things because the other two are smaller, but they have kind of loopy. I mean, think about like the Dairy Queen ice cream cone with the loop on it. They've got loopies on them. So they'll be fun things to dust. You can but, probably um, wash them. I probably can. Yeah. I mean, the Put idea the of the tap in the bathtub. <laughs> the idea of the glass is that I think even if you drop it, it's pretty durable. Like mm. it's not going to shatter like a like a glass cup would be because it's pretty darn it's solid. solid. Yeah. yeah. It might chip, but yeah, I don't know. It's solid and it's cured. I think it would take a lot to damage it, but I'm not mm. going to experiment with that. No, so no. We'll never know. There you go. <laughs> Well, so shall we introduce our last artist then, Linda? Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's bring Ruth Bieber into the house. Give Ruth a moment to pop on in. Maybe we don't have Ruth. Huh, just stand by for a minute, folks, and we'll see if we've got Ruth here.
I'm not seeing Ruth. Okay. Oh, maybe we lost her. Maybe we lost her. Yeah, I think. Um... Amy, this is Donna. Yeah. I'm just letting you know Ruth is still on the call. I've asked her to start her video. She may oh, have wonderful. stepped away for a moment. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, that's good. I'm, I was worried that, you know, you're always worried when somebody is uh, not responding and you're thinking, uh oh. Mm -hmm. you know, I, ho I hope they're okay. Um, well, well, we'll we'll fill some space while we're waiting for for Ruth to arrive. Um, Linda, can you tell us maybe just a little bit about what's going to happen with the in person gallery experience on the eleventh of February? Yeah, so we've uh, we've rent, rented a venue and it's in a building full of different artist studios. And this this is a big studio that we've rented for a week uh, to give Laurel lots of time to set the art up. And on the eleventh of uh, February, which is a Saturday. Well, uh, in the afternoon, we'll actually have kind of a formal showcasing of, of the art. And it'll be somewhat like what we've done tonight. So we'll have some mingling time at the beginning. We'll then have a formal presentation of the art and a description of it so that people really know, uh, you know, the, particularly the blind folks in the, in the audience will know what's uh, there. And and then afterwards we're gonna we have a little bit of entertainment and we have some refreshment. Sorry, Amy, you can't come. <laughs> I know I got the we've FOMO got, again. Yeah, we've got refreshments happening, and then people can go around and actually experience the art now that they know you know what it is exactly they're looking at. They can feel it. They can. Um, so I'm figuring out how to play my um, my uh, my poem. Um, apparently I can I can perhaps create it on a loop so that's the piece I'm trying to figure out cool. um but um yeah so uh two and a half hours that's all uh we've got three folks it sounds oh now Ruth left us oh dear we've got three three folks coming from Vancouver two coming from up island with and um we'll be there and then we've got eight or nine people from Victoria so it's most of the artists um, are going to be there and and hopefully the facilitators as well that are available so it's just it's kind of a party celebration wrap up of the the project and an opportunity and and the artists in Victoria that aren't almost live um, patrons are really excited about having an opportunity to um, to present their art and um, some of them would like to sell it as well and apparently we can do that we can we can sell if people oh. want to sell their pieces that will be av available as well and we're hoping that some of the other artists in the building will come down and get curious and will join our network so that we can actually have a a good um this was one of my goals with the project was to be able to come away from this project and 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 it not just be a one-off and that's it you know that we would have an opportunity to connect with people and and do it again, you know, perhaps with the same facilitator or a different facilitator and share our techniques, et cetera, with each other. So um uh yeah, so that's what's that's what's happening on the eleventh. That's really it's really exciting and I'm really glad that you uh have been able to find the funding to do this this I you know Felt like yeah. it felt like for a while it might have been in limbo right like can we find the venue can we find the funding can everybody come all of those pieces right yeah well well as it turned out you know everybody didn't need their 500 dollars for their art supplies um you know some of the some of the facilitators didn't work the full 20 hours because they weren't needed for that time and and so we had some funds left over and um we decided you know well, people are going out, people are doing social, you know, social things now there and, and here's a, uh, let's do it. And, and I had, I had some folks saying to me, I want to display my art, you know, and okay, <laughs> we'll make this happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you're talking, you're, some people want to sell their art, which I think is lovely. Yes. Uh, one of the things I, I struggle with as an artist is putting a value on something that I make. Oh so yeah. Are you going to perhaps I would a mentor? I don't, how do you decide that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm hoping that this particular individual's um, facilitator might have an idea because because he may be more familiar with what, you know, and there will be people there. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't really know, you know, 
uh, how this will happen. But um, you know, maybe we'll just we'll just uh, you know, maybe it's by offer. Yeah, might with be a, with, with a, what do they call that? Uh, uh, oh gosh, what's, uh, what's the word? You know, when you have like a minimum, there's a word. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it's like you, anything over $20, I'll take for this piece. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sell mine because it's my first and, and I would like to keep it, but um, you know, everybody's different. So everybody's different. That's right. And especially if you're going to be somebody who wants to continue creating stuff, um, there can and, be an awful lot of art that you have to hang in your, or put on your shelf or whatever. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I did hear Ruth come Ruth back, come back in. in. I think so. I heard heard that she'd come back. I'm just waiting for Vocalite to put her up on our on our screen, and that'll be our cue that Ruth is ready to go. This is Donna again. So Ruth sent me an email saying that they were having trouble. Oh, okay. I'm just watching Ruth square. I, um, I just oh, there's, oh hello. There's me. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, the magic you know, of technology. Yeah, I'll put my video on, and hopefully I'm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that was so strange. Okay. I just had to come back in. Hello. Hello, Ruth. <laughs> Hello, Ruth. That's okay. Linda and I can fill space until, you know, the cows come home. So you're all good there. Um, is there something that you want to say to introduce your piece, Spirals, um, before we show the image and listen to the image description? No, I'm dying to hear um, Laurel's description. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, then. I guess that's what we'll do. We'll go ahead and we will put bring up spirals. Got it right. on our screen. And Laurel, when you're ready. Um, so this is a four foot tall sculpture titled Spirals. The main structure is held up by a large curving metal stand with a hook at the top from which is suspended a number of multicolored spirals. A number of objects are scattered within the spirals, including a wind chime, which hangs loose, a stained glass dragonfly, and string lights, which can be lit up to illuminate the piece from within. Okay. Ruth, I think there's a lot to unpack here um, in terms of what, what, first of all, what is this, right? Like you know, painting, sculpture, what, what are we looking at? Yeah, so this is a, a 3D sculpture. Okay. And uh, yeah, this was my opportunity, thanks to this great um, project to create something using the, the 3D technology. Um, I'd heard about 3D printing before and um, last uh, fall, actually, during a Whitney call, uh, Accessible Arts call, there was a 3D uh, sculpture. And so I was able to ask questions about what the heck is this 3D sculpture? What is 3D printing? And um, so with a bit of research, it turns out most libraries have a 3D printer. Who knew? Very mm. cool. Um, Rick's going to take down the image now, just as we left it up there so that people could get an idea. Um, I, too, am really interested in 3D sculpting. Uh, so what was that process like for you, Ruth? Yeah, so first of all, what you need to understand about 3D printing is it it it, it, it has to do with uh, computer programming. And there's a uh, website uh, called Thingiverse, I think, Thingiverse, but um, as I say, um, and many thanks to the uh, wonderful librarians at the Creative Commons uh, at the Nanaimo Library, because they were help, able to help us with some of this um, uh, computer coding. So if you go to um, Thingiverse, for example, and you know exactly what you want, there are all kinds of programs available to uh, uh, help you create what you need. So you've got the computer uh, programming there, you press the buttons on your computer, and you send it off to a, a printer. In this case, it would have been um, in the NIMO, uh, to the NIMO library. Um, and it comes out in this 3D plastic material that is really kind of sci-fi, I would have to say. I imagine that that holding on to these spirals is really interesting tactily in your hand, because I think the way it, it, it was described sounds like there are several spirals that are kind of 
individual but kind of clumped together so uh yes. what yes. does that feel like when you're holding it in your hands okay and so thanks for that prompt um each of the spirals um is like a a slinky mm -hmm. except a, a really big slinky but they're kind of springy like that as well so the original plan because this was you know really evolved <laughs> it doesn't look anything like what my original um vision was um but that's you know the nature of art um i had I had hoped that each of these spirals um would represent one of the chakras in the body so each of them has the different colors based on the chakras and originally i had hoped um and this wasn't even the first incarnation i mean we're like you know several incarnations into the process um i had hoped that they'd be more in a line like the chakra system is in the body but th they're so springy there was no way we could actually do that properly um and so uh i i asked my um art partner facilitator audrey if she could kind of glue them together in a in a clumpish sort of way so that it's a it's it's actually nicer to feel and then each each one of them is a bit of a container so um there's always something i'm playing with it as we speak you know because it's right beside me the the um uh, just undid my headset and if uh the job the nvda speaks so you can hear that it makes noise right it tingles and um to me, it's very important that art have, you know, uh, titillate all of the senses as much as possible. Let's see, there goes the screen reader. It's very cool. Where does it live, Ruth? Oh, like, is well, it will it stay in your house or will you sell it? Perhaps. I, I'm planning, I, it'll be for sale at the event. It, uh, it'll travel to Victoria without me on Friday. And uh, I plan on making my way to the um, in-house exhibition uh, on the 11th and it will be for sale. And it would be a lovely addition to somebody's um, garden yeah. or patio or um, balcony or something like that. So, yeah. And the, the stand that it, it's on, so it's got kind of like a, it almost looked like it was wrought iron, but some kind of iron yes. sculpted stand that it hangs from. Yeah. Uh, did you all make that as well? Or is that something that you buy? Yeah, no, that was uh, um, uh, by our friendly dollar store. And, really? and it, yeah, and it actually is a hanger for hanging a plant. You know, ah. plant plant hanger, yeah, and and that that evolved as well because the original idea was to anchor it, um, you know, so that it would be anchored in the ground, right, and and not hanging. But again, it was just so, you know, it just springs around all over the place, so that was just impossible. So then that's when I, I said, we, we need to find something that it will hang from. We just must, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Audrey was in the dollar store one day and uh, there it was. And we tried many different you know, ways of um, uh, ha having this stand on the ground right. properly yeah. um, and hang from, and then this just appeared. So sometimes it's the magic of being persistent with your art project. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Ruth, when you had sort of disappeared for a minute, um, I was asking Linda about how as artists we put a price tag on our work. I'm not asking you to tell me what it is you're selling this for, but like how, what is that process like just, just to market it? That is um, a mind numbing experience. Yeah as you can well imagine. And so, you know, with my Creston exhibition, for example, um, I just finally had um, Wynne Din, who was my main um, art collaborator. She just, and, and she's, you know, been doing arts and she had her own art store for a while and blah, blah, blah. And she just finally said, this is what you must charge and you must not charge any less. And that was very, very helpful. 
And yeah, so, yeah, no, I, I, I gave up a, a rope to um, Laurel today with a price. <laughs> and so basically, you know, I've considered the cost of the materials mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a little bit cost of a bit of time. You never get all your time. You never do. I don't, I don't think unless you're really, really skilled and fast and stuff. So you just kind of put the numbers together and say, yeah, this is what I'd be willing to let it go for. And sometimes yeah. be negotiable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Great question. Linda, have you got any questions for Ruth? Yeah. Um, um, are the spirals different colors? Yeah, they, they all um, correspond to the various colors of the chakras as okay. we know them. Mm -hmm. Which are? For those of us who perhaps have forgotten or don't okay, know. Okay, so the yeah, <laughs> the base chakra is red, and then it goes orange for the second chakra, yellow for the third chakra, the heart chakra, which is four, is green, and then the throat chakra is blue, and then the sixth chakra might be I can't remember. It's, I think, indigo, and and there's a lot of discussion about so it, so what it's indigo the rainbow. is. It's the rainbow. Oh, that's, well, the, yeah, there you go. That's the, that's the Roy color Jibiv. of the rainbow. Roy, Roy there you Roy go. Jibiv. Roy yeah. Jibiv. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> there you go. Um, that's awesome. It's a lovely piece. I even like the little sounds that I'm hearing from the corner. So uh, it sounds like it would be, like you said, beautiful in somebody's garden spring a nice yes. time piece bring it in in the winter if you live in a snowy a snowy part of or a windy part <laughs> or a windy part yeah yeah yes awesome. well thank you ruth for sharing spirals with us we really appreciate that thank you it's a great project i really appreciate um linda and laurel's efforts and uh, it's, it's always lovely to be um a part of book a lot mm, thanks ruth um, all right, friends, we're going to bring in the just to transition to our Q&A, and it might be a little shorter since, um, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time chit-chatting. So uh, we'll have all of our artists sort of in the wings, and they can chime in vote, um, vocally. Um, but I'd like to bring in the two facilitators that are with us. So we've got uh, Donabelle and Tegan. Um, so let's bring those two folks into the space if we have uh, their cameras on, and we can do that. Because I'm curious, you know, we've talked a lot, of bit of, a lot about the artist's perspective, and certainly if you all have questions, we'll take those in a moment. But hello, hello, Tegan. And we'll just wait for... Hi. Hi. Donabelle, do you, do you go by Belle or Donabelle? Or... Um, usually Belle. Belle? Okay, that's yeah. great. So Tegan and Belle, I just, just wanted to start by asking both of you, we'll start with Belle. Um, what, what was it like as a facilitator being involved in a project like this? Um... It was so much fun, actually. Um, and you so, were paired with Christy, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, Christy and I, um, we met through my um, Facebook group that I created a few years ago, um, Rock Art Canada, where we paint rocks and we hide them um, just as a random act of kindness. Um, so we have this Facebook group where people can join and um, paint rocks for at home and hide them. Um, and anyway, um, uh, one of the projects that I had on my group was I, to distribute rock painting kits. Um, so she was on the list to um, for a rock painting kit. So I actually got to meet her in person once before the project. Um, but it was um, but once I met Christy and we um, and she was quite active in the group. Like I was actually really surprised. First of all, that she was um, partially sighted, or um, you know, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. What, what was Archie said it was great yeah yeah um that she preferred any sorry Chrissy and uh a little bit tongue-tied but yeah so you're anyway good. Um, doing good. <laughs> I was actually quite thrilled that she asked me to help with the the sunflower rock project, rocks project um and I knew that she'd be um fun to work with and we had a great time actually um we um you know I feel like she taught me a lot as well um, and I taught her how to paint, but really she had the basic skills um, after the rock painting kit distribution. I could tell that she had already been using it and just needed a little bit more guidance. And um, and yeah, it was great because, um, you know, I learned a lot about her as well and how we are very similar. 
Um, and that, I feel like we've um, formed a friendship because of the, the project, which is great. Yeah. Exactly what you wanted, Linda. Yep. yep. <laughs> Thumbs how about, up. <laughs> how about for you, Tegan? What was it like working with Louise and sculpting Princess Kiara? Uh, it was really wonderful working with Louise. I, um, I learned so much about uh, a different perspective of um, perceiving things and um, it, the project started off and Louise actually invited me into her home and I got to meet Princess Kiara and um, learn uh, about her, you know, Kiara's personality and um, take some photos and um, then from there, uh, you know, it was first when Louise said the, the scale that she wanted, I was thinking technically, you know, it can be more challenging to work in larger scales with clay. Um, but we sort of came up with a technique of coil building, um, as it's called, where you roll out uh, sort of um, strings of the clay. And um, so we sort of had and had a technique going where, um, you know, Louise would roll some coils and I would roll some coils and then um, we'd start building the shapes. Um, from the bottom up and um, then it, you know, making sure, you know, just describing um, Louise would constantly say like, uh, you know, what she's picturing and um, really uh, did, um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was just was, like a, was the entire sculpture of the dog a solid clay? Uh, it was actually hollowed out, so okay. it's empty in the middle, uh, which is important for it to make it so hard. Yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, and also so um, it has to be has to um, not be too thick, otherwise it can risk exploding in the kiln. So that's like another thing to factor in. Right. Um, yeah, um, I know we have a hand from Tilo, so. I think that's Tilo. No, it's, uh, I gotta put my glasses on. It's Tammy. Sorry, Tammy. T they have the same amount of letters and it starts with a T and they look the same to me. Um, so let's go with Tammy's got a hand. And then after Tammy is Lori. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, um, amazing presentation. I, you know, it's funny when the project was in announced last year, I thought about it and then I'm like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. So um, but now I'm thinking I could have done that. You got the FOMO, Tammy? Yeah, yeah, I could have done that. <laughs> um, and, and I will if there's ever an opportunity again. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I guess my question is, I don't know how to ask this really, but I, I, when I was hearing the various presentations, I've noticed that like some people made reference to the fact that, you know, they like, like to having like vision, like losing vision, you know, so maybe having seen at one point. And I'm just, I guess I'm just curious about, cause I, when I think about how you might've been visualizing your, your art, like in your minds, like if it was based on having seen something in the past or, um, because for me personally, because I have never seen before, I think it would be a very interesting process to kind of look at how someone like myself might envision mm -hmm. something. Um, for me, it would be more based on, you know, having something described to me or having felt something uh, as opposed to having seen it. So I'm just curious to know how, really... some of, how, how some of the visions came to people, to, to, to all of you as, as artists. Um, Go ahead, yeah. Linda. Well, yeah. well, for me, I, I have seen enough that I, I could, you know, these are actual I guess, fairly realistic images in my mind. They're not, you know, maybe not how other people see it, but they, they have some visual um, sort of um, backing behind them. I think it would be really interesting for, for two artists with different, you know, life experiences to see how they would create the same sort of thing, you know, the same kind mm -hmm. of idea and, and how you know, as you say, as I said, it was, you know, art is, is not about really about what you see. It's about what you perceive. Yeah. No, you and, said and, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how you put that, how you put that, uh, you know, out there. And I think that's what we have, 
you know, that's the, the piece that we as blind artists have to teach the world is that, you know, it's, it's much more about, you know, what you feel, what you perceive, what you, the, the emotions that something evokes, then really if something is realistic, a realistic, um, you know, sort of portrayal mm -hmm. of something, which is, that's a fairly, I believe a fairly new, new concept when it comes to art, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sort of not that, that old. And I mean, I think it's, you know, it's great because it, if it, it, it allows us to participate in something that, you know, um, you know, our, our image of something is just as, is just va as valid as, as someone, you know, who sees it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'd love oh, to could add something. Oh. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I'd love to ask some of our artists. Go ahead, Christy. It's Christy. Um, I know I have some vision, so I can see what flowers look like. But as I said, like, I can't see different shades. So I actually asked Val to describe a sunflower to me because I, and I realized that mm. I was drawing my petals too big because I was picturing like a pansy petal, which is more, it's wider. And when she described it as like very, very fine um, petals and she actually, I said, can you take my hand and move the brush in that motion? And I totally got it because even though I could see it, I didn't, because I can't see definition, I wasn't getting, I just thought, well, flowers have petals. All petals sound the same or look the right. same. Right. And it, it took that to actually um, get me doing it. Um, and still I was super critical because I'm like, that doesn't look like a sunflower and Belle would be like, you're leaving it. Because what I would do, I'd go, I don't like it. And I'd start script, like putting you white all over it. it. Just, yeah, I'd start all over. Um, and she would actually take it away from me and seal it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Good I for her. Good for it. her. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you, you know, you're your own worst critic, right? And um, the nice thing about rock painting is, I, this is what I tell everybody, is that anybody can paint a rock. And um, I encourage everybody to do it and try it because um, it's um, fun and therapeutic. I might and do it. And it I is just a rock. Like, you don't have to worry about ruining an expensive piece of canvas or, um, or, or something. <laughs> um, it is just a rock. So no harm in painting a rock. And yeah, it's up to you what you want to do with it. You can and um, having def like having that three dimension brings out creativity, right? And which is actually probably one of the more interesting things about working with someone like Christy was that it wasn't so much about having a lot of space to create the art, but um, just enough. And um, uh, anyway, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> um, so yeah, we um using something that anyone can have access to everybody can do it it's affordable um and yeah i i really uh encourage everybody to give it a try and and um i think it would be something that everybody can do and you know it was really nice to see that chrissy went from uh her her confidence level just went up after after we met and had a few sessions together and she even attended one of my um, rock painting events at a community center afterwards. And she inspired a lot of people actually to, to paint, um, to paint and not be so shy about painting and mm -hmm. just give a go at it. Yeah, so that was, that, that was um, something that the project um, really brought together the community and um, my relationship with Chrissy, like I said. That's awesome to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, again, what, what Linda wanted was for people to build relationships and to carry on and continue doing the work or some work. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And oh, I'm sure she will. And she's because it's it's become a hobby. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's take a hand from Lori. Then we have Tilo and Yuko. And then we've got Carrie. Uh, audio now unmuted. And I had one more thing I wanted to um, mention that I totally forgot, which I do need to mention. So that's OK. Put me in the put me in the lineup. <laughs> First, I wish I could come and feel everything. <laughs> I want to feel all the projects. I um, get that passport, Lori. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, I I wish that we had something like that down here in the states where we could go and do something like that because what my art 
passion is working with beads. I like beads. And I have a lot of projects here at home that I have done through the years out of beads. So I wish that we had something like what you guys have there in Canada here in the States where uh, you know, we could you know, lift you know, do I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you do. <clears throat> there probably are lots of arts grants out there. It's just finding somebody who's prepared to kind of, you know, do an, uh, do a grant proposal and and coordinate the the project but um we seem to have lots of money for that sort of thing up here which is great yeah because i i'm i miss doing the beads of the, the organization the lions blind center doesn't have a craft teacher now and so they don't do the beading like we used to and maybe you should propose the idea to them Lori, and and see if they can find some funding for it yeah because i i would love to be able to do it again i have Lots of stuff here in my house. It's all out of beads that I have made through the years, and uh, you know, I think it. You know, somebody could. You know, really. You know, it'd be something somebody could do that would really. You know, be accomplished to them that they could make something that they enjoy. You know, with yeah. the beads and everything. So Very cool. I just think it's everything that I've here today is like this great things, and it's like you know, I just wish I could come and see it all. <laughs> Well, well we maybe know. maybe we'll take it on the road. Yeah, right. <laughs> we know that when you come to visit, at least you'll be able to pet the statue of Princess. I get to Kiara. I get to I get to pet Kiara, the statue and the real one. And the real dog. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Laurie. Um, Tilo and Yuko have a hand. Give them a moment to unmute. Gotta love technology, right? Hello. Oh, we got you. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was an interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, when I was younger, I wanted to learn how to draw, but I didn't ask anybody because I didn't think anybody would take me seriously because of my eyesight. And um, I had a chance watching somebody using a soapstone wheel to carve. Hmm. Um, but he, at that time, he was only just used just ordinary soap, just to show me. And then once, you know, I, I found out about glass blowing, I wanted to learn how to do that. But like uh, um, um, Amy said, there was nobody around that teaches could teach blind people. So I, I kind of gave that up. But I thought that was kind of cool, the glass blowing. But one of the things I did at school is I learned how to make an ashtray out of a out of a copper. So I had to put it in the kill and I had to watch it for different it, it would I guess it would change different colors. I can't remember the different colors before you take it out and then you got to put it in in this mold and then you use a mallet or a hammer to uh, hammer to shape it and that and it does takes a little while for it to, to have done but I found that interesting working with uh, copper so uh, that's my my thing with uh, working with uh, with art more or less and well, I gave you're that also, you're also I gave a, that, go yeah, ahead go ahead I, I gave that to my dad my dad doesn't smoke <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I love that about the things that we used to make when we were either in high school or in elementary school. And, you know, like you make a macaroni necklace and you give it to your mom and you think it's the greatest thing ever. And when you grow up, you're like, oh, she never really wore the macaroni necklace. <laughs> made uh, a macaroni. <laughs> and my, my dad's a welder. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. So he could have made it himself. If yeah, he wanted yeah, it. But it, was, it was kind of nice for his child to do it for him. <laughs> I made my dad this this uh, thing for Father's Day once, which was uh, like a glass. Think think a bit like a snow globe, but it's made of, of of panes of glass. But it's about the size of a snow globe, and it's square. And all the copper is welded together to keep the glass together. And yeah. on the inside is on mine, anyways, was salt that we had dyed green, yeah. um, so that it looked like uh, grass. And it was yeah. I had tried to sew together what looked like a miniature golf bag. And when I look at this thing today, because I must have been in grade six, it's literally like like a piece of leather that has the worst stitching, and it's like you couldn't even know 
know that that's a golf bag, but I was so <laughs> proud of that thing. And my dad still has it in his office. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so when he says my daughter made this, they say, oh, how old is she? And he's like 40. <laughs> Uh, so see, my, my mom now, saved but she was her, six when she made it. her rocks yeah. what's painted, that christy i painted rocks for my mom and her oh, full circle neighbors actually want to steal them so now i have like how do i get rocks to toronto i don't know i, don't, I was really proud of myself a lot to like, ship them. i've known to someone to uh to uh, uh paint murals or, or little scenes on rocks mm -hmm. very cool Thank you, Tilo, for sharing. You're welcome. Um, Carrie has a question, so we'll go to Carrie, and then we'll go to Megan. Give Carrie a moment to unmute. Hopefully, Carrie can unmute. That's now we got you, Carrie. Can I have it? Amy, this is Donna. I think oh, Carrie. Oh, Carrie's just come back. Ah, okay. Some tech technical difficulties tonight for folks, eh? All right, so I think Carrie's just joined us. So Carrie, you, I understand you have a question. Let's see if Carrie can hear me. It's out of focus here. Mm -hmm. I hear Donna humming. Have we got Carrie? Sorry, I thought I was on mute. I think Carrie's just, she might not have heard that she is up because it right. was connecting oh there she is there she is all right carrie we Hi. finally got gotcha. you <laughs> sorry about that today the, of all days i having internet trouble and this has been like i've been doing this with you guys since the mid middle of the pandemic and this is like the best <laughs> night so far <laughs> i've had and i couldn't even tell you guys how, how i felt <laughs> but anyway here i am um i'm just sitting here uh really jealous ontarian because i would love to do something like this. And when I first heard you guys talking about it and then through the process, Amy, you talked about your project today. I think one of the Friday cafes, you were heading to the glass blowing place and uh -huh. talking about finding your pants and- <laughs> You've heard uh, that story already. <laughs> yeah, I remember that story. Um, and so I've had a chance to visit a few of these places like in a, in a, at a writing workshop I went to in Mexico. I went to a, a company there um with that's started by a man who has a physical disability and he has all employees with disabilities there that he uh, has in his, his factory and they make beautiful glassware and he sort of showed me around but yeah how close can you get with that i was so curious um and i'm he's sitting here with this piece of tactile art that a friend of mine made me and it made me think that maybe she i think she's moving to canada to be with her boyfriend sometime soon hopefully and I think maybe I'm going to reach out to her and see if she, someday she, 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 she lovingly made me this piece that's very tactile. Um, but I'd love to maybe work with her someday on a piece together. And this has given me that idea. So I just want to thank you guys because this is really emotional stuff for me. Um, like with Linda's piece about Shades of Grey, I, I've been losing sight over the last 20 or so years. And it took the color from me that I loved. And so I'm always trying to find ways to express myself artistically. Um, and using sound and doing sound art now, but the way you guys incorporated, it's a multi-sensory, multimedia experience. And so I really would like to come to see the see your opening up, but unfortunately I live in Ontario, um, but it is the day after my birthday and uh, it'd be cool if I could oh, we'll be, thinking about be, you and your be there to support you guys. Yeah. So, so Thank you. I'd um, love to support you and, and congratulate you all on your projects. Thank you. Me. Amy, this is a great segue to my little piece. Okay, go um, ahead, and then the piece, we're going to take Megan's question. Yeah, the piece I didn't mention is that AMI are doing a our community on our project, and they have been following some of the artists and will Great. be coming to the and coming to the art show. So there will be an opportunity for folks to, um, you know, to see the process again and to 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 see it from a different perspective. So. Um, I just wanted everybody to know that and we'll, I guess, through Vocali, we can let folks know when we know the, uh, well, the that was going to be my question is this is being, is this being covered somewhere? Because I, I, I would also love to talk about it on my podcast. Um, so I'd love yeah, yeah. to hear. Yeah. About, yeah. Um, so we'll, 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 once we know, once we know when they're actually going to do it, we'll, uh, yeah. get the word out there. And Carrie, well, I yep. can connect you by email to folks that you can invite on your podcast to talk about their experience. So. Yeah, if anybody would love to come on. I mean, we were, we, we interviewed Amy last year just about Vocali and about herself, but 
Um, I, I'm wearing some of your Vocalize uh, earrings right now. So I just, I love to promote what anybody's doing. If anybody does want to come in my show in the future, that'd be great. Carrie's got a, a great podcast. Love to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate the, the thoughts and the comments. And we'll go to our last hand, which is Megan. We'll give Megan a moment to unmute. There you go. That was amazing. Um, especially when you when you did the, the the playing with fire, that was really really good. Now, for me, I would be it would be hard for me to do it because you know rolling around and like, but I am like I burn very very easily. Um, yeah. if I were doing uh, glass blowing, how would I prevent myself from burning or getting dehydrated from the heat? Oh well, you're not uh, actually touching the glass. It's on a, a metal rod, so. Uh, it's just hot in the room um, oh. and you can stop and I had water too out of yeah. a nice glass that Benji made <laughs> but how would you be able to see what you're doing because um, yeah how would I was how would you see what I'm doing because I'm just being paired right and yeah it it wasn't it wasn't easy because you can't touch the glass so you have to use the the forceps and the pinchers are like blunt, giant teasers and then you have to find it and grip it and pull it and just pull it in different directions. Oh, I would not be able to do that. I mean, I, I think yeah. it's a I little bit, know, it's a little, could. a little bit like us, you know, fishing something out of a, a saucepan or flipping yeah. over a pancake yeah. on the stove. It can't, it, you know, you've got an implement between you and what you're trying to do and, you know, you learn how mm -hmm. to do it. So and it's five hundred dollars in three hours. That's yeah. a lot. Of it was for for a for a session. So the a session private was like session. three hours. Yeah, a private session. Oh, okay. So what would but we? There might be different different prices in different regions. Of course, check your local glass studio. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah I'll, I'll try it out. Yeah. Okay. Cool stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, friends, that I I wanna I wanna a cue Rick to play a round of applause because I think our facilitators and our artists, we deserve a round of applause. So Rick, friends, let's welcome and congratulate everybody. <laughs> I think we I think we can all be very proud of ourselves for the work that we that we did. And um, I'm so proud of my friends in this space. We stretched ourselves in ways I think that we some of us didn't expect to do and created things that we didn't expect to create. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that in that process. Not only that we have product, but a lot of beauty in the process. What do you say, Linda? Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. <laughs> Before we officially say goodbye to Tegan and, and Belle in the space, and thank you for just hanging out with us for a little bit and sharing a little bit about um, your experience. We have a prize draw um, to get to. So we're going to put Linda on the spot to do the prize draw. Oh. Um, we got Donna in the space and Donna's got the names of all of the participants uh, still with us in her trusty bag. And so Linda, whenever you want Donna to pull the name, you just shout out whatever keyword you want to shout out. Okay. Blind arts. Blind arts. Blind I love it. Arts. And the winner is Tammy. The winner Yay. is Tammy. Oh. Congratulations, oh, wow. Tammy. Tammy, what Thank you. Prize. So we'll make sure we email you, Tammy, and you can uh, we'll, we'll we'll connect with you about your prize. Oh, thank you! Wow, you're oh. welcome. It's been we about three years since I've won a prize, so that's great. We uh we love to we love to give away prizes. Thank you so draw. much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you to all the artists. It was wonderful. Thank you. You guys are all amazing. Oh but, my goodness, Tammy, you <laughs> asked a question. I would like to answer, but I didn't. I didn't put my hand up because I saw it was a big cue. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No worries. But, oh so my we'll, goodness. How about we officially wrap this episode yeah. up for the night and say yeah, thank, thank you very you. much to Linda and Laurel and all our guests in the space this evening. Uh, this has been the project Your Eyes, My Vision. Vocal Eye, vocaleye.ca. Special thanks to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, the province of British Columbia, and the city of Vancouver.